Mayor Savage, we are live. We can start the meeting on your call. Okay. All right, good morning, folks. It's a beautiful mid-May day in the Halifax Regional Municipality. And uh, everybody's happy, everybody's peaceful. Everybody's got a sense of joy about the work ahead of us uh, today. And I encourage us all just to keep that thought as we go forward. And one of the reasons we're very happy is that tonight at six o'clock, we will have our citizenship awards. For those of you doing it for the first time, I can assure you that you will be um, inspired uh, by the uh, young people that we will be honoring tonight. It's always really a highlight. And it's really a shame that we're not able to do it uh, in person because it really is um, one of those occasions that sort of reinforces your belief in your own community. So that's six o'clock tonight. We'll be doing that, of course, virtually. The deputy mayor and I and all of the uh, councillors will be uh, doing that. Oh, I see Councillor Kent's got some good news behind her that she's going to talk about. I noticed that. Excited. Know the family. Um, all right, so let's just see who's, who's with us. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, are you with us? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Daigle Gammon, Kathy here from... Uh... Lisa says she's in the bunker. I'm going to say that I'm in the Fall River Tower, um, representing Waverly, Fall River, Muscadabit Valley, and all the beautiful communities in between. All right, beautiful. Uh, Councillor Hensby. Good morning, everyone. It's a very pleasant morning after Brad Marchand scores an overtime last night to tie up that series. Way to go, Bruins. Way to go, Brad. Uh, things are going to be a great day today. <laughs> I see it's going to, the theme of the day is going to be local hockey players. Councillor Purdy, I don't know if there's been any good hockey players come out of Cole Harbor at all, but are you with us? Are you going to skip me, Mr. Mayor? Oh. Um, did I miss you? Oh, I thought I already did you. Sorry. <laughs> you sure did miss me. <laughs> all right. I'm sorry. Let's go to the uh, councillor for the Henmans. Councillor uh, Kent, good morning. How are you? District 3. I'm sorry. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council. I, uh, I Apology accepted. I I uh, want to continue with the theme of good things happening for young people in our communities. I'm really excited to be able to share this picture on my back screen uh, for a congratulatory message to Luke Hemman and his family who are uh, uh, still living, his family are still living in the Cowboy area of District 3. Luke has been the first uh, player signed to the new NHL franchise, the uh, Seattle uh, Kraken. So. I just hope that council will uh, support and follow his activities. And we, uh, we know good things are coming to him and his teammates for he's better off with having a, a good old Halifax uh, area, Cow Bay, Nova Scotian on the team. So uh, with your indulgence, I hope that you'll take the time to congratulate him, show his support. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today from beautiful Eastern Passage. It's a bright sunny day and looking forward to good work. Thank you. Congratulations to the Henman family, the whole crew. Councillor uh, Purdy. Good morning. Yes, congratulations. That is so exciting. And yeah, we are very proud of our Sydney and Nathan here in uh, Coal Harbor. Um, and happy to be here. Looking forward to today. Big agenda. Thank you. Councillor Austin. I'm here, Mr. Mayor, ready to go. Beautiful. Councillor Mancini. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, colleagues, uh, staff, everybody watching at home, ready for yet another very productive virtual meeting as we've been doing, running these meetings quite well since the pandemic showed up in our lives. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And uh, you've got a uh, pretty good hockey player in your community too, uh, Matty Highmore, who was traded from Chicago to Vancouver, Ooh. scored a goal the other night yeah. for his new team. He, so. he, lo he looks good in the blue uh, jersey too. Yeah, so too his father Dave and the whole family. Congratulations. Councillor Mason, District 7. Hello, Mr. Mayor and Council staff. Great to be here today. Looking forward to a uh, uh, nice long meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Smith. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor, colleagues. Councillor Smith here from District 8, Halifax, Central to the North, ready to go on this sunny day. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Councillor Cleary. Good morning, Mayor, colleagues, residents. Uh, coming to you uh, virtual from the uh, Williams Lake backlands. Uh, happy to be here on this gorgeous sunny day in District 9. Beautiful. Councillor Morris, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and colleagues and staff. Uh, 
here representing the good people of Fairview, Clayton Park and Rockingham and looking forward to getting down to business. Indeed. Councillor Cuddle, good morning. Good morning from Spryfield Sambro Loop and Prospect Road. Um, this nice, beautiful Crystal Crescent Beach behind me and um, hopefully uh, this weather will hold up so we can all uh, get out and enjoy some beach time. Indeed, Councillor Stoddard. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, and those watching from home. I'm coming to you from District 12, uh, Beachville, Lakeside, Timberlake, Clayton Park West, and Wedgwood. And behind me is Susie Lake, part of our um, Blue Mountain, Birch Cove Lakes area. It's beautiful. Indeed, it is beautiful. Councillor Lovelace, good morning. Hey, how's everybody doing? I'm coming to you live from uh, the farm at Hamas Plains, St. <laughs> Margaret's District 13. Um, and behind me is my office. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're just going to shift the uh, chat today from hockey to sailing. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking about uh, the sport uh, of sailing investment um, and lots on the go today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, yeah, out of the bunker and into the dining room for today. And uh, also want to extend my congratulations, continuing the theme of uh, local youth doing well. Uh, Caitlin Gannon of Beaverbank has uh, just been recruited by the Blue Devils, the uh, King's College Blue Devils. She is currently the captain of the Millwood High School rugby program and has been uh, signed to the Blue Devils and will be uh, continuing her rugby career with them starting in September. So congratulations to Caitlin and family. Congratulations. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody uh, from lovely Lower Seifel where we're good to go for the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Outfit. Good morning, Mayor, and uh, hello to everyone from uh, beautiful Bedford Wentworth. And like you, Mr. Mayor, I'm looking forward to the uh, young people we're going to see this evening. That's always an exciting time. Looking forward to that. Great, thank you. All right. Jacques Dubay, do we have you along for the ride? Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Looking forward to a constructive meeting. Awesome. And Mr. Traves on my other side, usually. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Good morning. Uh, I see our clerk is here in the corner and uh, appreciate the work that the clerk's office uh, continue to do for us. Thank you. Ian, colleagues, we'll look at uh, if somebody wants to consider approving the minutes of May the 4th, our last meeting. I will move those minutes, Councillor Russell. Moved by Councillor Russell, seconded by Second. Councillor Stoddard. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's carried. Approval of the order of business. Uh, Mr. Clerk, a couple of changes. Good morning, yes. Uh, we do have a request for item 13.3. Uh, it has been proposed to delete it from the agenda. And item 11.1.1, .1, second reading of bylaw U108 must be addressed after 1 p.m. today due to the noon correspondence deadline for a second reading of all bylaws. Thank you. So I'm going to go to the deputy mayor to just move the item 13.3 then. Uh, uh, that is going to come back in our next meeting. It just wasn't ready for this one. Uh, deputy yes, mayor. Thank, you, mayor. thank you, Mayor. I'm happy to move that 13.3 uh, be removed from uh, this agenda. It'll be brought forward uh, in a couple of weeks. All right. There's no I'll objection second. to that. Seconded by Councillor Russell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, so that 13.3 will be removed from today's uh, agenda. And as per the clerk, um, item 11.1.1 .1 will be moved until this afternoon if we're still in session. We have a consent agenda. There's a number of items on the consent agenda. Mayor? Councillor Mancini. I ask that 11.1.3 be removed from the consent agenda, please. Councillor Mancini removes 11.1.3 from consent. Thank you. Councillor Austin. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to remove um, the disc golf one. I think it's 11.4. 11 1141. Uh, 11 yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Smith? Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to remove 1152, please. Uh, that's the uh, request to include 2224 Maintenance Street uh, in the Secretary of Heritage property. Okay, so 11.1.3, 11.4.1, 11.5.2 are removed from consent. If there's no other questions, perhaps somebody will move the remaining consent happy, agenda. Happy to move the consent agenda as amended, Mr. Mayor. Second, Tim. Moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Outhit. All those in favor? Oh, we have to vote right. on this. So oh. we have to vote on this. I'll just read the items that are going to stay on consent. Um, by my reading, 11.1.7 is uh, the uh, uh, first reading on um, taxis, accessible taxis, limousines, and transportation network amendments. And 11.5.1 .1 was uh, including 2381 Moran Street and the registry of heritage property. So those two were on consent. Mr. Clerk. Beginning with District 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councilor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. District 1, Councilor David Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councilor Kent. In favor. 4, Councilor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councilor Austin. Oops, in favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councilor Smith. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councilor Morse. In favor. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. And that has passed. Thank, thank you. Um, we have our consent agenda. I, I also just want to let people know that there will be two presentations today. One is on the accessibility strategy, which is 11.1.6 by staff. And one is on the uh, Heron Cove uh, bus lane and active transportation infrastructure, 1131. All right. Call for declaration of conflict of interest. Motions of rescission. Sorry, uh, Councillor Smith, was that from the consent agenda that wanted to? Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, motions of rescission, deferred business, none, public hearing, none. Correspondence, uh, Mr. Clerk. Correspondence has been received for items 11.4.1, 11.6.1, and 12.1. This correspondence has been distributed to all members of council. Thank you. Petitions? Presentations? Information items brought forward is none. We will go to reports. 11.1. Point one is second reading uh, user charges on the student transit pass pilot program. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council one approve the phased in student transit pass pilot program as described in staff report dated February 1st, 2021 with pilot phase one expanded to include all students at each of the four identified schools in grades nine through 12 and to adopt bylaw U108, the purpose of which is to amend bylaw U100, the user charge bylaw, to enable a student transit pass pilot program as set out in attachment C to the staff report dated February 1st, 2021. I so move. Second by Mancini. Seconded by Councillor Mancini. Councillor Mason. So, uh, you know, not a lot on this. I think this is great. Uh, uh, and uh, certainly uh, it makes a lot more sense to encourage 
people, uh, youth uh, who are of the age to be able to take transit, to take transit instead of uh, having to provide school buses for them. Uh, certainly that was the case for me a number of times, depending on where we were posted when I was in junior high and high school uh, around the world. So this is not, not exactly something new, it's, it's new for us. Uh, but it also uh, goes, I, I think, to note uh, that this aligns with the United Way anti-poverty strategy, which suggested that we should be expanding uh, transit use for people under 16 uh, and seniors, eventually incrementally over time, uh, to be to have transit use for free. Uh, uh, and, and so in this case now, we've, we've made it so you can ride the bus for free if you're 12 and under. And now we're going to start with this pilot and then expanding, assuming it works, which I believe it will, through all the other high schools and, and, and grades. So uh, people nine through 12 can uh, get a pass and, and take the bus. And you know once you have a pass, you don't have to just use that pass to go to school. So it provides mobility for these folks. Uh, and I think that's great. So I strongly support this and I look forward to, uh, I hope council supports it too. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And having just advised everybody that we wouldn't be able to do this until after one o'clock, uh, I bought it forward anyway. So um, uh, Mr. Clark, do you wanna just speak oh. to that? We just wait and vote on this after one o'clock? Yeah, that would be my suggestion. We do have a mover, we do have a seconder. So after we come back from the lunch break, we can bring this forward with the motion on the floor and just vote after the 12 o'clock deadline. We need a motion to defer at this time or are we just gonna do it administratively? I think we can do it administratively. I have right. no concerns with that. Okay, thank you, Councilor. 11.1.2, uh, proposed amendments to uh, Administrative Order 15, license, permit, and processing fees, pavement condition, uh, in that, I'm happy to bring it forward, Mayor. That uh, would be Council Deputy Mayor Outfit. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 15 respecting license, permit, and processing fees, and set out attachment B uh, to the ta staff report dated April 16th, 2021. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, by Councillor Blackburn. I think I heard. Uh, Deputy Mayor, anything on it? No, we talked about this before. I'm strongly in support. Okay. Anybody else? Call for the question. question. Ready for the question. Beginning with District 13, Councilor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councilor Dagle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. Voting in favor of the motion. And that has been carried. Thank you, Ian. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. 1113, we took off consent, which is um, rehabilitation of the Harbor East Rec Campus, all weather sport fields. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I put the following motion on the floor that Halifax Regional Council award request for proposal number 21-007, rehabilitation of the Harbor East Recreation Campus all weather sports fields to the highest scoring proponent, Turf Masters Landscaping Limited for a total price of $2,619,665 net HST included with funding from project account number CP200001 Park Lee capitalization as outlined in the financial application section of the staff report dated April 20th, 2021. So move. Second. Seconded by Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, uh, we did get some correspondence on this, and uh, this was a planned. Uh, uh, rehabilitation of the field. And I'm wondering, Mr. Mayor, if uh, somebody from procurement is online, I have some questions about the process. Uh, I think hopefully Jane Pryor is online. I see Jane. Hey, good morning, Jane. Uh, welcome. I'm wondering if you could explain and uh, at a high level, 
you know, the process that uh, we go through when we look at a uh, request for proposal, an RFP such as this, I believe there were two companies that bid on it. If you could just briefly walk us to the process, I believe there's a two envelope system, how that works and how you score things. Thank you. Go ahead, Jane. Good morning, my name is Jane Pryor. I am uh, Director of Procurement. Um, Mr. Mayor, through you to the Councillor. So in this particular case, it was an RFP and therefore uh, it would be evaluated using a two envelope system. We would first look at the technical proposal that was valued at 80% of the total score. Those proponents who made, who scored over 75% on their technical score, we would then open their um, financial package, which was worth 20% for a combined total of 100%. So as we evaluated the technical, added the financial to it for a total score, the award recommended before you today for your consideration and approval would be the highest scoring proponent from that process. Uh, thank you for the explanation, Jane. And so obviously any company that bids on any of our RFPs, when they don't get it, they're disappointed. Is there an opportunity for that company that doesn't uh, uh, get the uh, the job to have some sort of conversation with your department to understand where they went wrong, why they scored lower th or than the other, uh, uh, other companies? Absolutely, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. Uh, part of the RFP process is the ability for any unsuccessful vendor to request a debrief, whereby the procurement lead and oftentimes the program manager would be involved in that debrief. Their proposal would be reviewed with them uh, and suggestions for how they could improve any issues that, uh, that were encountered with their submission or even some general comments around how they could enhance their submissions for next time would be provided to them. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate that explanation. You know, colleagues, uh, this is not just about new turf. Uh, that's obviously one of the biggest pieces, but we're talking about paving the entrances and pathways to make it much more barrier free, repairing the fence, uh, new clock, new soccer net, new benches, new shelters, and hopefully completed by the end of the summer. And I believe all the uh, groups that use this field have been communicated with and they understand this is coming for, forward and then you know, really, if there's an ideal time to do it is, is during a pandemic when the fields are not being used as much as they normally would. So I support this and colleagues, I hope you support this. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Anybody else on this? Ready for the question? Question. Question. <clears throat> Beginning with District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Oathead. Yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councilor Dave Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. <clears throat> Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morris. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. Voting in favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. That has carried. Thank you, uh, Ian. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Jane. 11.1.4 uh, uh, is discharge of development resolution 1568 Hollis. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Back to the right page. Hollis. I move that Halifax Regional Council approve by resolution the discharge of the development uh, resolution of Halifax Regional Municipality followed in the Registry of Deeds for June 21st, 2001, as document number 21006, located on book 6785, pages 177 to 192, from the title of the property, 1568 Hall Street, Halifax, PID number 00003954, I so move. Second. Second. 
Councillor Kent, thank you. Councillor Mason. This, uh, for council, this really is an administrative matter, matter uh, cleaning up uh, the, uh, the consolidated lots or what will be consolidated lots for development. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, my understanding is the development, uh, agreement, the resolution on D became moot when council discharged the Twisted Sisters development agreement some time ago. So, uh, this clears the way for the approved development, which, uh, the design review committee approved a, a little over 18 months ago. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. No questions. Question. Ready for the question. Beginning with District 15, Councillor Russell. Hmm. Thank you. Um, in favor. 16, Deputy Marotid. Yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councillor Dagle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. I'm voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councilor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. That has passed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Mason. 11.1.5, uh, which is incentive uh, bonus zoning 1724, 1730, and 1740 Granville. Councilor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt and authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into and execute the incentive or bonus zoning agreement, which shall be substantially the same form as set out in attachment B of the staff report dated April 29, 2021 for the eight-story mixed-use building at 1724, 1730, and 1740 Lower Water Street, Halifax. I so move. Second. Seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mason. So this is for the uh, what's now being called the press block building that includes the Dennis building, the old Acadian recorder building uh, opposite the legislature between uh, the legislature and Grand Parade. Great to see this moving forward. Uh, saving that heritage is an integral part of the uh, plan to re renovate, restore, uh, bring that block back to life. Really glad to see this here. I ask for council support. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Beginning with District 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor? One, Councillor Dago Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion? Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor of the motion. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. Absolutely in favor of this motion. 13, Councilor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. And that has carried. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Councilor uh, Mason. The next item on our agenda, colleagues, is 11.1.6. This is the accessibility strategy. And um, I'm pretty sure that Tracy Jones yeah, there's Tracy Jones Grant who's going to do a presentation, and I know that she'll acknowledge, but I also want to acknowledge the very strong work done by Melissa Myers uh, on this, who's an accessibility uh, advisor. Uh, so I will turn it over to you, uh, Ms. Jones Grant. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen.
All right, good. Oh, there we go. Good morning, um, everyone. Uh, I'm quite excited and quite honored to be with you this morning to do a brief presentation on the accessibility strategy. As you may be aware, this has been years of work for our team, um, and it is so nice to see that this is now ready to present to you. I too would like to do a special thank you to our accessibility advisor, Melissa Myers, for all of the work, time, energy, and effort that she's put into uh, helping to move this forward for us. And also, I'd like to acknowledge the entire diversity and inclusion African Nova Scotian Affairs team uh, for their contributions in this work. Okay. I shall begin with the, the motion. Uh, I shall begin with a, a background. So on October 31st, Regional Council passed a motion um, that um, we work with rock and roll uh, to prepare, um, um, to look at accessibility related issues and initiatives across the municipality. The motion also indicated that the Chief Administrative Officer through the Diversity and Inclusion Office continued to work on HRM's framework and reporting model for Halifax's inclusive and accessible initiatives with consultation and input from rock and roll. And that the CAO prepare a report outlining progress to date on the accessibility framework. And that motion was passed. And that is the motion that led to the development of the current accessibility strategy. The motions that will be before you today are to adopt the accessibility strategy as set out in attachment one, to direct the chief administrative officer to carry out the actions contained in the accessibility strategy as part of the multi-year budgeting and business planning process and request that the chief administrative officer provide annual progress reports on the implementation of the accessibility strategy to, to regional council. So why, why do we need an accessibility strategy for our municipality? Well, accessibility is an issue which concerns Nova Scotians of all ages, um, from those with disabilities to parents traveling with their children in, st in strollers to seniors in our communities. And for many years, as part of the of council's regional plan, we have acknowledged that accessibility and inclusion are an important part of our work. Our accessibility strategy will outline how all business units, employees, and citizens of the Halifax region can continue to improve accessibility and contribute to the, to the goal of a fully accessible province. We developed this uh, strategy with both internal and external consultations that strongly supported the need for us to have an accessibility strategy to guide our work. <clears throat> in 2017, as we know, the province of Nova Scotia passed the Accessibility Act, which prescribes public sector bodies, including municipalities, to complete two key items. We must have an accessibility advisory committee, and we must develop an accessibility plan. Halifax Regional Municipality has had our Accessibility Advisory Committee in place since 1996. So our, our focus has been on the development of an accessibility strategy. And in September 2020, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion in African Nova Scotian Affairs presented a draft on the accessibility strategy to the Accessibility Advisory Committee and then in January, we presented a draft to our diversity and inclusion leadership table. It's also important to recognize what the province is saying. So they did consultations on the creation of the Nova Scotia Persons with Disabilities Act. And they came up with uh, five areas that they felt needed to be addressed as part of accessibility, built environment, employment, public transportation infrastructure, infrastructure, information and communications, goods and services and education. So far they have come up with two prescriptions, create the accessibility advisory committee and create a strategy. 
So our strategy contains recommended actions developed in alignment with the Nova Scotia Accessibility Act. It is designed to follow the accessibility directorate goal of an accessible Nova Scotia by 2030. It contains 30 action items to be actioned over the next nine years. This is 2021 and we're aiming for 2030. And actions of the strategy may be impacted or adjusted if new requirements come out from the province. So part of this work is um, dependent on what comes out from the province from the province. So I briefly want to highlight for you what we're saying in the, in the strategy. So when we think about the built environment, um, some of our recommendations around the, are around the lines of um, Rick Hansen Gold Certification for Future Infrastructure. Some of our employees have taken um, Rick Hansen Certification through the Nova Scotia Community College. And this is the standard that is being set out by the province. We are also looking at the CSA B561-18 accessibility standards. Those are national standards. And we're looking at developing an accessibility audit system for our buildings, our public facilities, our parks, our playgrounds, trails. And we're, we want to look at this whenever we are looking at doing upgrades uh, so that we can ensure that we maintain accessibility. When we think about employment, one of the directives of the province, we're looking at um, employment equity reporting to collect and maintain data on employees with disabilities. Incorporating accommodations into our hiring pro procedures, training our hiring managers on workplace accessibility identifying work placements and internships for students with disabilities and looking um, at our workplace accommodation policies to ensure that it's accessible and inclusive. When we think about goods and services, we're talking about things like accessible signage, signage templates, walkways and equipment. For example, <clears throat> our signage that we have uh, around beaches and parks and playgrounds and our recreational facilities. We're looking at um, uh, how, we can, how we can do improvements to our recreational services and operations. As we know, we have more and more requests uh, for accessible recreation services, but we also need to recognize that it is often difficult to get staff to help support those requests for accessible services. We also want to ensure that we have increased accessibility training for municipal staff. And through that, and through our accessible advisor, accessibility advisor, we have developed a whole training program on accessibility and understanding accessibility in the workplace and when we're developing our programs and services. When we look at communications, Again, improving how we share information with our accessible community stakeholders. Are we sharing? Are we making sure that the things we do are getting to our communities? Developing an accessibility guide for how we promote, how we write, and how we communicate, uh, both internally and externally. And also, of course, we want to ensure that we have a strong relationship between ourselves and the Provincial Accessibility Directorate. Continuing along when we think about communications, because this is so important, you know, we, we want to ensure that when we do consultations with communities, that we were doing this um, to be inclusive and accessible. And what does that look like? Looking at um, developing accessibility policies and procedures, looking at our web content so that it aligns with the standards for accessibility and looking at how we are promoting accessibility and sharing information on our public facing website. Also in alignment with what the province has identified as a priority, looking at our transportation. So um, looking at how, um, and, and a lot of this work, I, I also want you to understand is already ongoing, has been taking place, but identifying and implementing um, accessible bus services and, and in improvements, developing a passenger sur a survey around accessible services, 
imp improving public awareness around snow removal. When we have, were first writing this report, of course, it was in the middle of winter. So that was one of the things that we wanted to highlight. It's now the middle of summer. But again, we want to ensure that people um, with accessibility needs understand what services may be available to them when it comes to snow removal. Um, identifying how to increase the number of accessible taxis and accessible taxi providers. Uh, we hear quite often that there's limits to um, accessible taxi services and people wanting to be able to move freely around through our municipality. What does this mean for us financially? So approval of this strategy will result in an increase in um, multiple municipal service level standards and theref therefore require an increase in funding for future operating and base capital budget programs. The specific items that are listed in our current strategy that is attachment one required to meet these objectives have been included in our current 21-22 four-year funded capital plan presented to council February 26, 2021, with the understanding that some project scopes and estimates will fluctuate. Examples of existing projects that are currently integrating accessibility improvements are listed on the slide here. And just for example, you know, park recapitable capitalization, bus stop accessibility improvements, accessible bus replacement. So we are already in the process of doing this work. <clears throat> Some of the, the uh, strategy action items propose are proposing new HRM programs and processes that may be, be absorbed in current staffing and other capacity additional service program delivery outside of our current capacity, as well as any new or increased capital work added will require an increase to the average tax bill or reduction in other services. And we also have to recognize that should provincial legislation for establishing accessibility standards influence the prioritization of recommended accessibility capital work, causing a greater funding and resource pressure on high risk asset renewal and desired growth projects. So in other words, should the province come out with other regulations or requirements, we may have to revisit um, what's required of us as a municipality. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity to pre present a, a general overview of the accessibility advisory the accessibility strategy. I'm so proud of this work, so proud of the team. Um, and I really look forward to continuing our work both internally and externally to move us forward to be an accessible and inclusive municipality. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Um, I appreciate that very much. And again, thanks to Melissa for the amazing work she's done. I'm gonna go to Councillor Daigle Gammon who's gonna put this on the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. It's my pleasure to make the following motion that Halifax Regional Council adopt the accessibility strategy as set out in attachment one of the staff report dated April 19th, 2021, and two, direct the chief administrative officer to carry out the actions anticipated in the accessibility strategy as part of the multi-year budgeting and business planning process, and three, request that the chief administrative officer provide annual progress reports on the implementation of the accessibility strategy to regional council. I so move. Second, Second Council. Councilor Russell. Yay, Second look at Brian. all the seconders. <laughs> I'm not gonna decide who seconded that. I think everybody did. Councilor Daigle Gammon, did you wish to uh, lead off on discussion? I would, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Tracy Jones-Grant um, and to Melissa Myers. This was probably one of the nicest reads that I have done since coming to council. Um, it's motivating and it's inspiring. And uh, to think that we have an accessibility strategy like this is just such a compliment to your team and to the dedicated work that they've done, but also to the level of engagement. When you look at all of the groups that you've engaged with to make sure that you're talking to people with a lived experience and making sure that there's a first person voice in this strategy is very evident and uh, just my compliments. 
I think the other thing about this is that it's not just an accessibility strategy, but this leads to a definition really of what is inclusion and what does inclusion look like? And this behavior, these beautiful 30 steps that we'll get to work on over the next nine years are what's building inclusive communities. And so for me, it's a, a marriage of my past life now and my <laughs> current life, which uh, is really nice to see. But I also think that it's going to be a welcome resource for other municipal units. And I do think that you know, I've always thought the sharing of uh, knowledge is really good. So that shared learning, I hope there's an opportunity there for your team to share this kind of work with other municipal units as well. And that's pretty awesome. Um, and so I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, <clears throat> my thoughts, I'm sure we'll have other things to say, but yay, just so well done, so well done. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tracy, to you and your team, as always, thank you very much for the work that you do. Uh, you know that your department is one of my favorite departments. Uh, I, uh, so I have some questions about, um, you mentioned in your presentation when we do upgrades to our facilities, our parks and playgrounds, that we'll, we'll, do, we'll look at things through an accessibility lens, but how do we make sure that that doesn't slip through the cracks? Because uh, as Councillor Dago Gammon just mentioned, you know, we need people to have that lived experience to look at things. I know you alluded to training, but uh, how do we make sure that doesn't get missed? I, I'll give you a couple more questions and I'll, I'll be quiet and let you answer them. You talked about signage also, Tracy, with regard to when it's due to replace signage or upgrade signage, look at it from an accessibility point of view. I also want to ask about from a language perspective too, right, which is part of your department, right? We're seeing some signs show up, our welcoming signs being trilingual, English, French, Mi'kmaq. You know, how do we, we make sure uh, the majority of our signs, when we upgrade them, that we're adding those languages. And is there any consideration? I look at Councillor Morris's district and, you know, the uh, strong Arabic speaking population. Uh, do we have any Arabic uh, signs? And are we looking at doing that uh, because of the high uh, percentage of Arabic speaking uh, residents that we're so fortunate to have? Uh, the hearing impaired piece also jumps into my head. Uh, I look at, you know, the the many, many uh, press conferences we've seen from the, the Premier and Dr. Strang, and uh, you know, I, I haven't seen us, and maybe I missed it, but when we do things, and whether it's even our, our regional council virtual meetings or our standing committees or community councils, uh, you know, any discussion looking at having that interpretation for those that are hearing impaired, impaired. And my last question, Mr. Mayor, is when we look at other municipalities across the country, Who's leading the way with an accessibility strategy? You know, who are some of the places that we look to and say, wow, look at what they're doing? Or is that us? I, I, and I don't know. So thank you again, Tracy, uh, so much, Mr. Mayor. All right, Tracy, I hope you have a quick pencil to write those <laughs> <I> down. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. We always appreciate uh, uh, your support of our office. Um, so talking about not um, the accessibility upgrades not getting missed when we do the work, I think we need to recognize that we have some pretty committed executive directors who have had their eye on this, who are committed to this work, who support this work, and it'll be through their leadership. Um, and, and I know that I've had the, the pleasure of working with many of them in even developing this plan that we know that this will continue. Also, we, we are looking at internally what the, the procedures and the processes will be to ensure the work happens. Um, but again, a lot of that is led by our executive directors who are very committed to this work and who, who support and will ensure that they see this as they move their, their projects forward. Your question about language accessibility. I am currently working with our communications department, having that conversation on, do we need a language policy and what would be the languages and how would we do this? So this is a topic that we're currently discussing in our office, um, again, in partnership with our communications department. When it comes to sign language interpretation, for council and our press conferences and things, I think that that is very important. I know during the times of COVID, when we were doing our briefings, uh, working with our office, we immediately connected with emergency management office and we were able to put that in place. And I do think that that is again, something that we will be looking at for all of our public facing work. So right now, uh, as part of our work going forward in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, 
anything that we do, we're now doing to include sign language interpretation, closed captioning. So that's becoming part of our process, but we also need to understand the costs. So we're using ourselves as a pilot so that we can also share that with business units, with council, um, so that people can understand if you're going to do an inclusive consultation, these are the costs that you need to consider. And I think of that too, uh, Tracy, sorry to interrupt, but when we do our public hearings, for example, or, or uh, public information meetings where we're having, e even once we get through the pandemic, but virtually, or when we do them in person, we don't know the audience, that, you, know, you know, who needs that kind of assistance to be able to show up at least there as a starting point, I think is so respectful uh, to that community. We're getting ready to do a community conversation on municipal services with the African Nova Scotian community. And we're gonna be providing sign language interpretation as part of that circle. It'll be online, yeah. um, but it's our first time. And we have no way of, of identifying who in the African Nova Scotian community might've been missed because there was the need for sign language. So we're just providing it. We didn't ask anybody if they needed it. We're making it part of our inclusive um, outreach. And for your question on leading the way, I'd like to think we are. A lot of research was done, you know, over the years as we prepared to develop our strategy. And we do know in this province, there are smaller municipalities that are doing a lot of work around accessibility. Um, but I would, it, it, there's a lot of stuff also happening, you know, in Ontario and Western Canada. But locally, I think the province of Nova Scotia is really kind of setting the standard because what we have done locally is not just have the province write it and input it on municipalities, but municipalities have written, engaged their communities to develop their plans. So I'd like to think we are, but I couldn't say for sure. Thank you, Tracy. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I seem to have an ambulance going by my area right now. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, so uh, thank you, Tracy, for this presentation and for the incredible work that you and your team have done with all of our business units and such. Um, it's interesting because uh, this morning I have two pages of notes in my notebook from a call from a resident who has mobility issues who had a very, very disheartening and disappointing pointing engagement with one of our municipal personnel in relation to a challenge that she has related to excessive bus on her street, around the streets and roads and such. It's quite disheartening enough that I want to kind of, you know, investigate it a little bit further. Um, and it brings me to the point in our, in your presentation and in our municipal culture around where would we see some energy and at what levels, some energy put into helping our, our staff, our municipal personnel who public, have a public interfacing with residents and with people with disabilities to understand the nuances related to putting yourself in their shoes to be able to uh, understand the perspective that they're coming from. We, we want, we know those persons with disabilities, in this case, it was a mobility issue, have the best understanding, they're the lived experience, they're the first voice on explaining what it is that they are in need of, of something, but not all people, uh, certainly in society, and that would, it, that would be within our own, our own, our own staff level, uh, have experience working with people with disabilities and, and, or have a language, an understanding of language and an approach um, to best serve them. And, and would we find, would we have mechanisms captured within this, in the, within this strategy? And, and I guess some more information about how that might roll out to support that kind of training on our own level. We need our municipal personnel to live this engage, and, and, and really in, envelop this strategy as they do on many occasions. But this is a very uh, direct, personal, much more personal approach to working with residents of all abilities in our communities. And it's a, it's a really important piece. I don't want to ever get a call like that again, that this is coming from a municipal staff member. 
Um, and I'd like to think that 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 can be resolved and things can move forward. But I don't think it's going to be the first and only time. So part of this needs to help us create a culture within our own house to uh, give the tools that our staff need and the training and the insight and opportunities to uh, because not everyone does. I have I have uh, I mean, it's not we're not all most of are not oblivious to the needs of people in our communities who have various challenges and various abilities and disabilities, but how do they execute that? Not everybody's good at it. And it doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means maybe they need some support. So I'm wondering if you can support, can respond to that. Do you, Mr. Mayor, to the counselor. Before we even launched our strategy to you as council, we had launched a new program on accessibility awareness training. And that is training that is, um, uh, put on by our accessibility advisor. Um, it's very well developed and any employee in HRM can take that training. So it's, it's fairly new. Um, and it's also a little bit harder to do online than it is in person, but we're, we're getting through that. So all staff have access to that training. The other thing is that I can tell you, and again, um, business units are very proactive, I'm finding when it comes to accessibility and wanting to support their communities. For example, we've had where um, a business unit will partner with CNIB and staff will go along on a walk uh, and learn what it's like to walk with low vision, no vision, to be blind. Uh, staff have also partnered um, to be able to maneuver through the city in wheelchairs. So there's different training and experiences that we are providing to staff to understand. So if you are dealing with roads and sidewalks, um, that business unit has taken the initiative to, to put people in wheelchairs to say, here's what it's like, here's what you will experience. So when we're looking at developing roads and sidewalks, these are some of the things we need to keep in mind. So there is that. I would say you will probably get those calls again because we're on a journey. So we have to help people through that journey. We have to help provide them with the education, the tools and the resources that they need to understand that our response in one way to one group might be totally different to another group, to one individual might be totally different. So it is a journey, but those resources and tools do exist and we work either, uh, our team works specifically with a business unit or we provide it through the corporate training so that people are increasing their awareness and knowledge around accessibility. And again, the strategy once approved by council also gives us more, um, I don't wanna say ammunition, but I guess I will, to be able to push that in the organization to say, this is a priority, not only for us as the administrative part, but it's also a priority of council. We need to do this work. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kent, and thank you, Tracy. Councillor Ru uh, Russell, did you wish to speak to this as well? Simply, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was uh, very pleased to see this accessibility strategy come forward. Uh, we, I brought it up yesterday at the Accessibility Advisory uh, Committee meeting. Um, I'm curious about our contractors. Um, we have, uh, as I think we've all seen, and, and this follows on uh, uh, one of the points that Councillor Mancini mentioned, um, I think we've all seen the picture of uh, a blind person walking along the street. They walk by a lamppost and the uh, sign is directly in front of their face. So they will walk into it because there's nothing indicating that it's there and it's not normally there. HRM staff aren't the only people who do this. Uh, our contractors, uh, and I'm not saying that our, our staff do this, but we are not the only people who erect temporary signs. Uh, our contractors do as well. So I'm curious about the um, requirement for our contractors to adhere to our standards. Uh, and I would hope that the onus uh, for any training or anything else um, or, or any qualifications uh, rests on the contractors themselves. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Um, I was also curious to uh, hear you mention a, a minute ago about uh, um, giving people a temporary uh, lived experience uh, in in a wheelchair or in some other in some other device. And and I've seen conflicting reports on that. 
where a number of people suggest that uh, that is uh, a benefit. And a number of other people have uh, conducted uh, studies that show that it actually increases. Um, uh, I don't want to use the term prejudicial, um, but certainly, uh, certainly uh, uh, not the not the type of uh, uh, behavior or the experience or or the appreciation of it uh, that we think should be there. So I'm wondering if you could address both of those. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, uh, your second question first. Um, first of all, we don't do this in isolation, so we're always working with community partners when we provide any type of experience. I would like to think that for the employees in HRM, this is a positive thing, um, that it is uh, eye-opening and educational. I have not heard within our organization where it's been detrimental or resulted in negative, or we've heard some negative things. What I've heard from people who've um, participated in some of this hands-on training is the amazing experience that they've had, that eye-opening moment, not realizing, wait, now this is what somebody experiences, where as an able-bodied person, I don't. Um, so we're finding that it is um, a very informative way, especially when we work with partners. So if I was to just grab a wheelchair and take somebody out and say, you know, here, let's go up, that's not going to really educate somebody. We need to ensure we're working with the partners who are explaining the nuances, who are understanding, you know, just because I sit in a wheelchair, I'm still an able-bodied person. That doesn't necessarily mean I understand that experience. So we, we're always working in partners. Contractors. I must say that I'm not too sure I can answer you that question. I, knew, I know that we have a new social procurement policy um, that is really looking at um, how we are procuring and who's doing work with us. Uh, I believe that that would probably be a question when it comes to uh, whether contractors follow uh, our rules. Um, that is, I'm sorry, an area that I couldn't speak to uh, properly, um, and I apologize for that. That's all good. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure that it was on somebody's radar. So thank you, thank Councillor. You. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Tracy, and to your team. I am so supportive of this strategy. I'm really happy to see this move forward. Um, as someone who uh, I think, you know, as a representative of a rural area, we really struggle with having um, accessibility and universal design in our parks and um, transportation and, um, you know, limitation as far as getting the access of us uh, to service our communities. So, you know, there's certainly a lot of um, challenges for us. So I, I, I'm interested in hearing how we're going to measure the success of this strategy um, to make sure that uh, while there are infrastructure um, that supports accessibility and universal design. Uh, it isn't available throughout the entire district. And so when we do um, parks uh, recapitalization, for example, there, there are limits, uh, obviously, from affordability of some of these things, but also uh, limits as far as what we can and cannot do in some of these parks. So, um, you know, the importance here is how are we going to measure the success to make sure that we are thinking about ways to um, advance this strategy, but also reach past some of these challenges and, and address those. And, and I'd like to use an example of a father in a wheelchair going down a uh, rural road. Um, we'll pick uh, you know, a, Ham a road in Hammonds Plains, for example, where there's a gravel uh, shoulder trying to get uh, the child to the park, um, but the barriers are there for that father in the wheelchair to actually help. Uh, that child, you know, in, in this park structure, because it's not desi designed for all ages, it's not designed with universal in mind. And so sometimes what we're seeing as well is a, a feeling, what I'm hearing from families is tokenism. So we're having a structure that's actually outside of the main uh, play area 
um, for that child in a wheelchair or for that parent in a wheelchair. Um, so I just wanted to get a sense from you, how do we move into this all ages approach when we do recapitalization projects? And also how do we hear back? Where's that feedback loop so we are measuring for success? Thank you, Tracy. To you, Mr. Mayor, to the counselor. Thank you, counselor. Um, and and this, is, this is a difficult one um, because it is so much based on lived experience. I wanna take my kid to the playground and all of these barriers face me. Again, and, and please don't think I'm just saying this as platitudes because um, it is my, it's my reality in my work. We have strong leadership that is committed to accessibility. So as we're looking at um, the, the redesign, the development, as we're doing this move forward, and again, it's also provincial requirements, we have to look through that lens and we have to be held accountable to that. So some of the accountability is to the province and some of it is to our, our citizens. How we will measure our success? Well, first and foremost, we will have to come back to this council annually to say, here's what we've done. Um, and we will also, as we're looking at our policies and procedures and our guidelines, and we're including a more inclusive and accessible lens, we'll be able to measure that. The team is also looking at what tools we need um, in order to measure success because we don't necessarily have all of the data we need. We may not have all of the data that says um, what the barriers are in certain parks in certain areas. There's an, uh, there's an abundance of barriers in the rural and not so much in the municipal. So we need to, to collect this information. We need to analyze it and then we need to plan. And again, this would be our team working closely with in this example that you used, for example, would be parks and recreation. I know that it's on their radar. I know that they have that commitment to inclusion and accessibility. And so as they're looking at things, um, they'll be designing with that in mind. The other piece though, that is important and is probably most important to you as counselors is, is that we may not know what our citizens are saying. So, if we don't have that information, it's, it, it, it may get missed. So we need to know also, and again, it's where our team goes back out and does those community consultations. What are the barriers? What are the things that we need to be thinking about that we can bring back? In the plan, we do have some broad success measures, you know, like we've got some broad things that we know that by the end of 10 years, by, by 2030, this is where we need to be. But we will be measuring this all along as we go. And again, we will be reporting back out to council. Our team will be, be reporting back to our executive director's team. Our team will be working closely under the direction of the CAO to say, this isn't just words on paper. Here's the actual actions and accountabilities that go along with this. So we're pretty excited. Yeah, no, the, and, and I, I know this is a work in progress and uh, it's one step at a time, but I, but I do think we need some kind of a feedback loop. And even if it's just a place on our website where uh, parents and families can give feedback and give kudos, you know, hey, this is great. We love this new, uh, you know, play structure. It's, it's awesome. Or, you know, uh, hey, can we make a couple of changes here and there? And so we do have an opportunity for residents to uh, to provide us with direct feedback about what's working, so we know how well we're doing. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Councillor. Thank you, Tracy. Councillor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and and thank you, Tracy, for this very comprehensive report to you and your team. It's um, it's obvious that you had a big commitment to engage the public in this report from beginning to end. So, congratulations. Um, my questions are around accessible taxis and um, I'll just, I'll fire off a few questions if you don't mind and hopefully you can um, uh, share your experience and help me understand better um, some of the barriers to getting accessible taxis more widely in place. Um, so my understanding is um, per trip, accessible taxis are about half as much as Accessibus. Is, uh, could, you, could you confirm that? Um, and uh, we have a declining number of accessible taxis over the last number of years. I'm wondering if you could maybe get, give me a sense of why we're seeing fewer of them. I think it's the um, 
the expense of purchasing and outfitting the minivans? Um, and also, what are the biggest barriers right now? If we if we wanted to get accessible taxis in place by January 2022, what, what are the barriers to doing that? Do, is it that we have to have an IT system that works with Excessive Bus? Is that, is that one of the bigger barriers? So thank you. Tracy, I think you're on mute. <laughs> yes, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Oh boy, um, I may not be able to answer your questions. This might be more for um, transit uh, because they deal specifically with um, taxis, excess bus and those types of things. Um, but what I can say is that um, we do know that there is a declining number of accessible taxis uh, in HRM uh, at this time. And so as to give you a better answer, if I may, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Rigi, who is our Executive Director of Transit. Hi, ah, David, how are you doing? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Dave Rigi, Executive Director, Halifax Transit, uh, through you to Council. So uh, in terms of transit's role in accessible taxis, um, the one thing I can speak to is that Council did approve um, a, a project whereby uh, Halifax Transit will be standing up um, basically a, a subsidized equivalent uh, of, an, of an accessible taxi system. So that, that was approved by council. That work is ongoing. Um, do expect, uh, you know, probably late fall, early winter, we'll, uh, we'll see something go, you know, up and running with that. Uh, next step for us is getting an RFP out the door uh, within the next few months, uh, basically to provide that extra layer of, of service. It's not accessible bus, but it's, uh, you know, the equivalent of an accessible taxi that happens to be, uh, you know, uh, basically subsidized by the municipality. Okay. Councilor Morse. Yes, if I could just follow up on that, thank you. Um, so are you saying that the RFP will be going out in the fall or winter to add a certain number of accessible taxis? Is that it? So the, the RFP I would expect will come out in the next uh, few months uh, with the hope of having something stood up by the fall or winter, um, basically contracting with a party that will provide, um, basically it's not the, the equivalent of an accessible taxi service um, to, to the public. And do you know how many, sorry, do you know how many would be added, how many taxis? I, I, I don't have that information. I, I actually wasn't actually expecting to speak on this today, but um, you know, the, uh, that would have been approved by council, I believe, just uh, a few months ago. So that, that, that staff report is out there for sure. And we can be happy to follow up afterwards. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to um, to Tracy, um, I just want to say I love this report um, in particular, how you've laid out the strategic objectives and fit that into a work plan. And I think as we go through the next nine years, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to how we progress on a number of these initiatives. Um, I mean, it, that, that's great. Uh, it's a great tool, I think, for us as council to have, have a, a document like this on a topic that's so important. Um, you know, I, you know I, I see one of the challenges in this um, is embedding um, kind of this initiative around accessibility across all of HRM and our departments and our employees. And, and um, I too believe that a, a lot of our senior directors are very committed to this work. Um, but where I see kind of the, a lot of the important work happening is on kind of the staff, is with the staff on the ground. You know, the, that's those staff going to um, do maintenance or servicing an area to be able to recognize where there is a deficit in our accessibility and being able to have the mechanisms to bring it back up the line. You know, you mentioned that, um, you know, an important part of this would be collecting information, that, that we need to kind of collect the information to determine the work. And I, and I think there is something important in how that information is collected and that it's not kind of a siloed project in and of itself, but it becomes part of a culture of doing things 
in our in our municipality, kind of across the entire spectrum. Um, you know, I know that often those frontline, you know, staff who are on the ground doing the work, they often know best and see things that, you know, aren't seen by other people who aren't, you know, in the moment in the place. And, you know, a great example of this, um, you know, particularly in the rural areas is, is a boat launch in Terrence Bay. Um, there's a person with a disability who uses, we, we have an accessible ramp down to floating docks that, you know, he, he uses that to access his boat. Um, that's all paid by a ratepayers association. But when I look at the infrastructure, that's our infrastructure surrounding that, um, we don't have a ramp, like, you know, the ramp to the ramp it isn't there. There's no marked accessibility parking spaces. So it's kind of like, we're there, but we're only halfway there. And when it's about accessibility, halfway there is not there at all. And, you know, so I think when we when we start to move this forward, um, you know, I see that we have training um, for staff. It is in the strategy around, you know, how to accommodate uh, folks and how to serve folks. But um, I think like even a deeper dive into, you know, all staff, being trained with the eyes to see where there's the need and embedding those mechanisms so that those details aren't missed and, and they kind of lead to a truly, everyone feels part of it and, and it leads to a truly accessible municipality. I think that's really exciting. And to some of the um, pieces that Pam, I think Pam brought up children, you know, that, that this is also like a big part around, around kids and how we create a city that's, you know, accessible to accessible to everyone and thinks about, you know, the needs of the different users of the spaces in our in our city. You know, we've brought forward some motions recently around snow clearing, um, you know, policy to try to better meet the accessible, you know, to create more accessibility for, for people in how they not only in their ability, but how they use and fun how they use the city assets that we have and how they you know what they need to function. So um and, you know, I think that the, my last point is the real recreation strategy is also, I think, a great opportunity to think about accessible op needs throughout our very large municipality. Um, you know, whether it's just providing accessible walking opportunities for people, I hear about that a lot. You know, and it's very much a recreational piece, but it's also about accommodating people's needs for exercising and access to nature and all the rest of it. So I'm, I'm, I am, I too, like many of my colleagues here are, are, I'm very excited to see this come forward and look forward to supporting this work as it moves forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor mm -hmm. Stoddard. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and to you, Tracy. I just want to thank you so much for this excellent report that has come from you and your staff. And I can see with the detail that you work very hard on this. I just had one quick, quick question. Is it possible this program um, could be made mandatory for all HRM staff? I know it's a bit of a reach, but you know, I was thinking in small groups maybe or something like that. To you, Mr. Mayor, to the counselor. Um, so when we look at training and identify what's mandatory, we have a, we kind of annually review this with our human resources department. Okay. But again, recognizing that the accessibility strategy is and will hopefully be a priority of council and a priority of the province, we will really be pushing this training. Okay. Keep in mind, we have one sort of advisor who leads this work. We have 4,000 employees. So we right. are, you know, working with our human resources department on how often we can even physically do the training, but also working with business units because sometimes business units might want something a little bit more specific from us. And so we have to realign and readjust the training to meet that. Um, so we're we're looking at from for all of our employees <clears throat> to have training what i'd like to just say is that this is going to be a process 
We mm-hmm. are just really beginning our journey. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of back end work that we now have to, to go back and do. We, we, we need to look at policies. We need to really look at this training. Uh, we need to look at that whole audit. How do we know what's out there? And are we hearing from our frontline employees who walk past that and know that there's no accessible parking spot, but we might have a ramp right there. So there's a lot of back end work that we need to jump into and really start moving things forward. Um, and, and that includes making sure that those of us who work in the municipality can start looking at things through a more diverse and inclusive lens in all that we do, whether it's answering a phone call at 311 or you know, running a fire truck down the middle of the road because we're off to a fire. So this is, this is gonna yeah. take us time. Yeah. But we are committed to training our staff, to working with our teams, to getting the information. And again, we also are committed to ensuring that we keep council informed on the success of this work. Just one more thing, Tracy, if you wouldn't mind. Um, we, I'm sure we have some accessible, uh, limited accessible um, staff members on HRM. Is there any way... Um, possible we could reach out to them just to um, ask them about their own experiences and add them to our list? You're smiling. You've probably done that already. (laughs) Well, no, no, actually. So um, when it comes to employees, people have to self-identify. So I might see somebody that I might think has a disability that I might want to approach, but if they haven't self-disclosed to me, I can't do that. So I think, again, as we continue our work, as we develop more data on what our employees look like, we'll start having more of those conversations. We also, you know, when we do internal consultations, we also put out the call. If, you know, you are a person with a disability and would like to bring us uh specific perspective to this conversation, you're more than welcome. So we can't sort of pinpoint employees and go out and reach out to them. Um, So that's that's part of where the limitations are there, Mm -hmm. but we will be encouraging any employee to provide feedback as we get to that stage where we we need feedback uh, on the work that we're doing. Right, it's confidentiality and all of that. Yeah, okay. And thank you so much. Not all, vi- not all disabilities are visible. And that's really, true. really important. So, you know, this I couldn't true. point out to people. This is true. Thanks again, Tracy, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And thank you so much, Tracy, for this incredible body of work that has been presented here today. Um, you do mention that, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, as you put it, back end work to be to be done. Is this an opportunity for an expanded role for the Accessibility Advisory Committee? I'm Just to, as I point out to <laughs> Councillor Blackburn, we can't see you, or at least I can't. I don't know if maybe I've got too many squares open up uh, or not, but if your video isn't on, it would be helpful if we could see you. Go ahead, Tracy. Oh, no. Through you, Mr. Seems Mayor, like- to the councillor. <laughs> we will definitely be working very closely with the Accessibility Advisory Committee. I know that they are currently working on their work plan. It's a meeting last night, but they will, um, they are our advisory committee, and we will need to work very closely with them on the things that we're, we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, my camera is on, Mr. Mayor. I'm not sure why it's not. Uh, I'm not able to be seen, but uh, I'll uh, I'll work on that. Thank you. Yeah, maybe it's something. Maybe I only get so many pictures. I don't know. Um, okay. Um, oh, there you go. Now we see it. Um, uh, Tracy, I just want to say a couple of words before I hand it back to. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon to to close this. Um, I do again want to just thank Melissa. I'm sure she's she's watching this. Um, She works closely with folks in my office and and we really appreciate that relationship and the work that she does with you. Um, You know, I'm very proud of what the city's done in accessibility. Before the province had an accessibility directorate, um, we were working on accessibility in, in the city. And I know that because they stole one of my staff who was doing a lot of work on accessibility, Josh Bates, to go to work with the legendary 
Jerry Post, who headed up the accessibility directorate when the province set it up. Jerry's been a great champion in this community of accessible issues. And uh, as much as anybody has, uh, I would say, influenced uh, the work that Dave Riggi spoke to earlier of accessible taxis and the improved system that we can provide. So appreciate that. Uh, and Paul Vino, who uh, has, uh, is the CAO's special advisor. I don't know how many CAOs have had a special advisor on accessibility issues, but Paul has fulfilled that uh, role. And he's had lots of his own challenges, but he brings that experience to the city. You know, I remember talking to Rick Hansen, it's gotta be close to five years ago um, in my office when he talked about, we talked about Cogswell and he was the first time I heard about the Rick Hansen certification gold standard. And he, he said that might be a, a, an interesting candidate. And the next day I, I phoned uh, Donna Davis and she was in touch with Rick Hansen and it became the first municipal project in Canada to be designated as um, uh, a gold accessibility project. So that's been very good. I think there's been a, you know, a fair bit of work that's been been done on this, and certainly your department has has done um, you know awesome work. So to all the folks who've pushed us in that direction, and particularly want to thank all the councillors who've served on the accessibility advisory committee. It's an amazing group of people. So I, I just want to say thank you to you and to Tony's question earlier about are we leaders? I don't know if we're the leader, but I certainly think we're a leader and. We've been pointed to at conferences that I've been to on accessibility by people like Rick Hansen as a leader. Uh, and I thank you and Melissa and everybody else on that. Um, Councillor, I don't see anybody else. I will go to Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, and also one of the cool things council did long before I got here was that they uh, provided a pretty good deal to uh, your former uh, organization. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon at a pretty good price uh, so that that wonderful facility could be built. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, absolutely, um, because of HRM being the first government partner into DASC's new build, there is a, a beautiful 26,600 square foot fully accessible barrier free building for persons with disabilities uh, in Dartmouth. That is exceptional. And it is a model across Canada, actually. So we're very, very proud of that. And I have always said to every level of government how proud I have been that HRM was the first partner uh, for us to get the land there. So thank you very much. And to Councillor Blackburn's point, uh, you know, Councillor Russell and I are two of the councillors now on the Accessibility Advisory Committee. And I absolutely took those marching orders to heart and <laughs> make sure that uh, we do our level best to support the work. Um, one of the questions was really around, uh, I think Councillor Mancini, you had said about how um, keeping it in the forefront. And from my previous world as well, I had the pleasure to work with Melissa Myers. And I know that she has been at provincial and national tables that look at the Canadian Disability Policy Alliance and the work that's happening there. And so the, the defining and the evolution of always looking at things through a disability policy lens, I know that she is uh, probably one of the top ones around doing that kind of work. And I've seen her uh, bring that lens seamlessly into conversations so that uh, I know that she's always done a fantastic job. So again, my compliments. I do think that as this is, you know, our, our first real strategy, you know, we have something to measure against now to Councillor Lovelace's point, right? In the absence of a strategy, it's difficult to be held accountable. And so now we have these measures. And I think the fact that it's gonna come back annually to council, that is a place where we are going to see it evolve. Um, uh, Tracy very eloquently said that when the province changes, we will have to look, we'll have to be flexible and respond with our strategy accordingly. So I think it's a great thing to have that from the very beginning, an awareness of being flexible and knowing that it's not gonna be a rigid strategy, that it will evolve as we need it to with a lived experience. So I think that that's great. I also will share that uh, not all the training needs to fall on HRM and our staff. The community partners that we have in HRM are phenomenal and they have been engaged um, by this office very, very well. So a shared online experiencing, building stories and videos and training that people can access at their leisure will make that kind of training available and easier for everyone. So, you know, hands down, I think this is a strategy that uh, is a leader uh, absolutely in Atlantic Canada. Uh, I can say from personal experience, 
that uh, I know it to be a, a leader and something that will be modeled. Uh, so I ask your support of this strategy, hands down. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, all right, just last one thing I want to say on this is we acknowledge a lot of people that we have somebody in our community named Steve Esty that maybe people don't know, but Steve has been an unbelievable champion for people with disabilities. He was part of the Canadian um, Coordinating Committee championing the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabilities, which was passed by the government in 2006 and ratified in 2010. And Steve Esty uh, is... Uh, internationally acknowledged as a leader in disability issues. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Beginning with Mayor Savage. In favor. District one, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Absolutely in favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Having trouble with my mute. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. I would vote four twice if I could. Nine, <laughs> Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. Absolutely in favor. 13, Councillor Lovelace. That was a yes in ASL. <laughs> 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes in favor and all the positive things that I could say. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Otet. Yes. All right. Thank you, uh, Ian. That motion passes. Again, thank you to you and your team. Uh, Tracy, for the uh, great work. We appreciate it very much, and especially to Melissa. Okay, colleagues, thank you for that. 11.1.7 has passed on consent. That was uh, uh, bylaw T1005, amending uh, bylaw T1000, respecting taxes, accessible taxes, limos, amendments, uh, license uh, appeal committee has passed on consent. We will go to um, 11.1, coming out of executive, 11. To one, which is amendments to administrative order respecting the Women's Advisory Committee. Um, in terms of reference, Councillor Blackburn, is this, uh, is this you? Yes, indeed, sir. Thank you very much. I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt the amending administrative order, the purpose of which is to amend administrative order number 2019-004-GOV, the Women's Advisory Committee Administrative Order, as set out in attachment to the staff report dated March 3rd, 2021. I so move. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Lovelace. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much. Uh, not much to, uh, to add other than what is uh, in the report. This is just uh, uh, an amendment to uh, add uh, racialized women to the uh, complement of, uh, of uh, uh, folks that we'd like to see on the, uh, the Women's Advisory Committee. It was uh, not included the first go around and the committee felt it very important to, uh, to uh, say specifically that uh, that's uh, what we are looking for when uh, looking for members for the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. 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 Okay. Yeah. Begin, beginning with District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. And Councillor Morse. In favor of the motion. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. Great addition, in favor. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Otet. Voting yes. And Mayor Savage. In favor. So that motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Is that everybody? 
I didn't jump the gun there. Okay. Um, colleagues, we're moving to 11.3.1. This is the Herring Cove Road bus lane and AT infrastructure. And I believe we have a uh, presentation on this before we put it on the floor. Uh, who do we, whose face am I looking for? Do we have Peter Duncan, Tanya Davis, Harrison McGrath, Kate Green? Harrison, yes, is you? Hello. Yes. Harrison McGrath, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, just waiting for the presentation to load. Um, my name is Harrison McGrath. I'm a transportation planning engineer with uh, planning and development. And today I'll be presenting a, a brief presentation on the Herring Cove Road uh, recommendation report. Uh, so part of the project rationale around, around this uh, report um, really started with the adoption of the integrated mobility plan back in 2017. Um, the IMP recommends the development of strategic corridor plans on existing roadways that are key to regional traffic flow, transit, goods movement, and active transportation. Um, Herring Cove Road uh, fits, fits all of these uh, key, uh, key needs for transportation. So it, it certainly is uh, viewed as a strategic, strategic corridor. Next slide, please. I just wanted to provide a, a brief summary of um, all the times that we have been can to cancel and, and received approval around some of the aspects of this plan uh, related to Herring Cove Road. So the active transportation's priority plan was uh, approved back in 2014. Um, so that was the, the, uh, the plan before the IMP that recommended all the, um, the routes and, and types of infrastructure for our cycling and, and uh, pedestrian networks. Um, the active transportation priorities plan recommends uh, cycling infrastructure on Herring Cove Road but uh, was labeled as to be determined, which, which just mean that, or meant that uh, a facility type hadn't been uh, decided at that point. So the integrated mobility plan was approved back in December, 2017, um, as I'm sure most of you are, are very familiar with. Um, the rapid transit strategy was approved by council last May, which is the higher order um, transit strategy for the municipality, which uh, directs the implementation of bus rapid transit and additional ferry routes. And we were also back to cancel in September of last year around uh, ICIP federal funding. Um, this is investing in Canadian, or er, investing in Canada infrastructure program. Um, so council approved the, uh, the request to uh, both the federal and provincial government around uh, funding for this project. Next slide, please. So just to summarize some of the project objectives, um, the primary objective was to provide a long-term corridor wide vision for Herring Cove Road. Um, as I will get into in, in uh, later slides, the Herring Cove Road, um, the cross section varies a fair amount. Uh, there's some sections with, with kind of newer updated in infrastructure and uh, some areas definitely need some, some upgrades. Um, to identify and understand potential options to reconfigure the corridor, to improve quality and consistency of transportation infrastructure for all users, um, to evaluate all recommended modifications and changes through the pillars of the integrated mobility plan, and to complete functional design for a selected corridor option that enables a strong understanding of the property requirements and construction cost impl implement implications. Uh, next slide, please. So this, this report really covers um, a, a few projects that have kind of formed together over time. We first started a functional planning project uh, that was completed back in fall of 2019 um, that looked at the, the area of Herring Cove Road from the Armdale roundabout to uh, Civic 554, I believe, just south of, of Greystone Drive. So the functional plan uh, was very heavily focused on adding cycling, in, uh, both pedestrian and cycling infrastructure. Some of that has been implemented uh, just south of Greystone Drive near the uh, 500 block where new sidewalks and, and bike lanes were added last year. Um, but, but also the functional plan recommended cycling lanes uh, for, for the entire uh, study area. And uh, there was also some transit lanes added from Cowie Hill into the Armdale roundabout. 
so after that plan had been completed, the rapid transit strategy was adopted in, in spring 2020. And the rapid transit strategy recommended uh, uh, increased level of transit priority and, and actually uh, a bus rapid transit route for the length of this cor corridor. Um, so we had to re redo part of the functional plan where transit lanes weren't already included. Um, so in the green broken line, you can see uh, that section's labeled preliminary design phase one. And this is from the Armdale roundabout to Glenora Avenue. So what we did in the preliminary design was, was take the functional plan that, um, that had been completed and we updated the plan to also include the recommendations of the rapid transit strategy. So this, uh, there were some additional bus lanes that were added and uh, the only significant change to AT infrastructure was uh, there was a section that we were looking to do bi-directional cycling lanes where we shifted to use a multi-use path uh, just because the, the space and, and property requirements uh, made it necessary. And then phase two of the preliminary design uh, is the section that you can see in the red broken line. Uh, so this is from Glenora Avenue and out uh, just south of Greystone Drive. So we'll be uh, redoing or updating the functional plan to include transit lanes. Next slide, please. So here's, here's a few pictures of the existing conditions of Herring Cove Road. Uh, the top left uh, photo shows a section between the roundabout and Persis Cove Road. Uh, this is a very unique section with the reversing lanes. Uh, as you can see, there's a concrete sidewalk on, on the right side of, of the screen and just an asphalt sidewalk on the left side. And both sidewalks are abutting the road. So it's, it's not a very comfortable place for people walking and there's no dedicated cycling infrastructure. Uh, the photo on the top right is uh, between Glenora Avenue and Old Sambra Road. Um, so there's two outbound lanes, one inbound lane, uh, and there's only sidewalk on one side with, with no cycling in infrastructure along this section as well. Um, accessibility of, of some of the bus stops is an issue here. Uh, people accessing the bus stops just have to walk on the shoulder of the road. And one thing that we find is that if a, if a vehicle heading inbound is turning left, say to the, the Tim Hortons or, or Irving that you can see in the screen, um, sometimes vehicles will kind of swerve around and use the shoulder to go around the, the stop vehicles. So it can uh, create a safety issue for pedestrians. The bottom left picture is within the more commercial area of, of uh, Herring Cove Road between Williams Lake Road and Dentith uh, Drive. Um, so this section is, uh, has two lanes of traffic in both directions with a, a center left turn lane. There have been uh, upgraded concrete sidewalks and some landscaping uh, on both sides as well. And to the bottom right is a picture uh, at the southern extent of the study area uh, between Sussex Street and Greystone Drive. Um, this area has two lanes of, of traffic with uh, a center painted median and in concrete sidewalks on both sides. So the area that has the actual highest tra traffic capacity for this study area is actually the, uh, the furthest um, at the end of the study area where it's, it's not as needed as some areas. Next slide, please. So a main driver of this project is also the, the development, um, both potential and, and recent development. Uh, Spryfield uh, has seen a fair amount of development over the next or the last few years and uh, is expected to continue to develop it and see a lot of uh, potential growth. So within the red area on, on the screen, um, we have either concept plans or accepted development plans for up to 2,300 units within the current urban service boundary. Um, so to account for the, uh, the added uh, densities and populations out here, um, Historically, transportation engineers would have tended to just widen the roads uh, to kind of reduce the traffic capacity that, or, or uh, reduce the traffic congestion. Um, but what we've we've seen over time is that that leads to induced demand, so and, and more congestion. So as a road is is easier to drive on, more people do drive, and it just it's a kind of a cycle that just repeats itself. So this amount of development really shows the need for. Um, us to implement sustainable transportation options um, as per the direction of the IMP. So both uh, pedestrian cycling and, and uh, transit um, 
infrastructure. Next slide, please. So the functional plan, uh, which was completed in 2019, uh, completed all the sidewalk gaps that there were along this, the uh, study area, added a multi-use path between the roundabout and Cowie Hill Road, and then protected cycling lanes for the remainder of the study area from, from Cowie Hill to Greystone. Um, one thing to note, we, we did have two options during the functional plan. There is an interim option and uh, ultimate option. So the interim was, was meant more of a, a quick fix that um, added on-street cycling lanes with the use of, of the concrete curbs and bollards, while the ultimate actually added, moved the curbs, add raised uh, cycling lanes that were protected kind of outside the roadway at the sidewalk height. So we are, we are, uh, we're not considering the on-street um, option now. We are recommending that, that the, the more ultimate or, or long-term option is, is built out. Uh, and as I had mentioned before, there is a transit priority lane added inbound from Cowie Hill Road to the Armdale Roundabout. Uh, the total cost estimate, which was a, a Class D estimate for the corridor, was $21.6 million, and that does not include uh, property acquisition. Next slide, please. So here's a, a picture of the rapid transit strategy recommendations uh, for Herring Cove Road. As you can see, the yellow line um, travels the length of the study area from Greystone right to the Armdale Roundabout and then continues on to the Halifax Shopping Centre, um, Spring Garden Road area and Scotia Square. The blue outlines along that yellow line are where transit lanes are, are recommended through that, through that plan. So inbound uh, transit lanes recommended the entire way and outbound, uh, it's recommended that that begins at Cowie Hill Road. Uh, the reason for that is, is largely due to the topography um, along that section from Cali Hill to the roundabout. Um, we have kind of rock walls and, and retaining walls on each side. So the space is, is uh, difficult to work with in the area. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the preliminary design updated the, the first functional plan to add some of the transit lanes in, in areas that did not have it. Um, it also just furthered the design and, and added more detail, um, especially around things like retaining walls, property impacts, um, utility impacts, and, and updated our cost estimates. So there are, there are minimal, minimal changes to the functional design. Um, as I mentioned before, the most uh, noteworthy was the change from uh, multi-use path to a bi-directional, or from bi-directional uh, bike lanes to a multi-use path just between Cowie Hill and, and Glenora Avenue. Um, no vehicle lanes are removed within this section and the cost estimate was between 10.3 and 12.6 million and also that does not include property acquisition. Next slide, please. So phase two, um, this is the remaining, remaining part of the project that needs to be completed. Uh, we're expecting an RFP to be issued uh, sometime this year, which is included in this year's budget. Um, that project, it, it will be a kind of a, a full corridor type project where we do multiple rounds of engagement. Uh, we present some concepts to the public and, and collect feedback and, and do the design through an iterative process. Um, through that section, there likely will be areas where we need to uh, remove vehicle lanes in favor of active transportation and transit infrastructure. Um, but this, this will all be uh, uh, presented to the public at some point. Um, and we'll evaluate the multimodal capacity and consider as of right development um, that I had mentioned before, but also the potential for additional lands to develop that are currently in holding zones or urban reserve. Next slide, please. So we do have federal uh, funding opportun opportunities. Um, the federal government announced in earlier this year that there is a $14.9 billion uh, or billion dollars in funding for public transit over the eight years the next eight years. We don't have the details of how that, uh, those funds are being distributed nationally, but we're expecting that Halifax will receive uh, a portion of that funding. Um, also, the, uh, the application for the ICIP funding that was approved by council and submitted to the province. So I believe we're still waiting to hear back on, on that funding opportunity. Um, but one thing to, to note is that federal funding cannot be used to purchase land. So 
In order to receive the, the full benefit of that funding, we do need to complete the designs in advance and, and acquire the land um, through our resources. Uh, next slide, please. So as uh, stated in the report, um, uh, this should, should say, uh, shouldn't say the Transportation Standing Committee, but the two recommendations for uh, council to direct the CAO to do are to endorse the plan, uh, the functional plan and further integrate with the recommendations of the recently approved rapid transit strategy and to initiate efforts to acquire property to widen various sections of Herring Cove Road to accommodate dedicated uh, active transportation and transit infrastructure. Next slide, please. So if the recommendations are approved, the next steps will be to issue an RFP for phase two preliminary design for the remainder of uh, the Herring Cove Road study area and to program detailed design and land acquisition uh, and construction to be phased over the next five to 10 years. So this is a pretty lengthy corridor and uh, certainly won't be done in, in one or two years. It'll, it'll need to be done in um, uh, many sections as road recap uh, comes to, comes to be, uh, or the road recap is, is required. Uh, next slide. And that is it. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the presentation, uh, Harrison. Colleagues, I think I'm gonna propose we take a break now. It's a beautiful day out. Get out and stretch your legs before you take some lunch. Uh, it's 11.51, we'll come back at one o'clock. We'll put the, we'll deal with the other motion that, uh, has to be dealt with after lunch, 11.1.1. We'll vote on that and then we'll put this motion on the floor. Are we okay with that, uh, folks? Uh, well, whether you are or you're not, whatever. Uh, that's what we're going to do. I get to do that. So uh, get up and enjoy a bit of sunshine, folks, and we'll see you in uh, one hour and eight minutes. Just a reminder to everyone, please return to this Zoom link. We will be muting your microphones and shutting up your cameras until we return at one o'clock. We will be returning to the live meeting streamed on YouTube. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.
Good afternoon. It is now 11, it is now 12.59. We have returned your microphones and cameras. Mayor Savage, we do have quorum and we can start the meeting as soon as you give it the call. Okay, and just give me a, we'll just wait one. Uh, we have quorum, we have, we're good to go, we think. We're going to be we going are, right into a, we are good to right go. into a vote, so I want to make sure everybody's available. Uh, Okay, let's go in. All right, Mayor Savage, you are live on YouTube and back over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and uh, folks watching um, at home. We are going to uh, go back. Item 11.1.1, this was... Uh, Second reading on user charges, expanded student transit pass pilot program was put on the floor, uh, seconded and debated. And we had to hold off on the vote, but Ian, I think we're, unless other, unless other, anybody else wishes to speak to this. And this, is to, vote. and this is to confirm no additional correspondence was received prior to the noon deadline. Beginning with District 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative here. Three, Councillor Kent. <laughs> Councillor Kent. Four, Councillor Purdy. I'm here, sorry. Councillor Purdy, this is to 11.1.1, speaking uh, to the motion that is on the floor, just seeing if you're voting in the positive or the negative. Voting in favor, thank you. Thank you. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Ten, Councillor Morse. Voting in favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Othet. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. Councilor Daigle Gammon. Councilor Daigle Gammon. Council, I can see you're unmuted now. Councilor Daigle Gammon, can you hear me? It's Mayor Savage, we, we do have a vote that has been passed on that. Um, we are going to work to see if Council Dick Gammon can hear us or not. I can hear you now. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Can I, can I just get a notification on your vote on 11.1.1? I'm sorry, I did not hear the conversation. This we're, is... we're back to the very first one. This yeah. is item 11.1.1. .1. The item was moved by Councillor Mason and seconded by Councillor Mancini prior to the break. We're just doing the vote now because we've hit our correspondence timeline. 
Thank you very much. I vote in favor of the motion. Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Kent, have you entered the meeting? So Mayor Savage, that vote has, we have gone through everyone, that vote has gone 16 to zero. Thank you. That motion's carried. Okay, colleagues, we're gonna go back. Just before we uh, broke, we had a presentation from uh, Harrison McGrath on the um, Herring Cove Road bus lane and active transportation infrastructure. It was moved, uh, has been moved, sorry. Uh, Councillor Mason is chair of transportation. Your name is on here to move that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to one, endorse the Herring Cove Road functional plan and further integrate with the recommendations of the recently approved Rapid Trans Strategy 2020, Strategy 2020, and two, uh, initiate efforts to acquire property, widen various sections of the Herring Cove Road to accommodate dedicated active transportation and transit infrastructure. I so move. Second, Councillor Cleary. Second. second by Councillor Cuddle and Cleary. Uh, Councillor Mason? Thirds, perhaps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the key piece of the presentation was that there's, there's four to 5,000 more people already uh, moving to an area that already has uh, experienced some significant congestion and traffic issues and clearly is under service with sidewalks and uh, active transportation infrastructure, in addition, of course, to our ambitions for bus rapid transit. Without projects like this on Portland Street and Bedford Highway and uh, uh, on, on the Herring Cove Road, uh, bus rapid transit simply won't work. And that is our path to uh, absorbing, to better absorbing the population increases that we're now seeing in Halifax and project for the foreseeable future. I, you know, it's interesting to note, and we've heard this in other reports and other uh, briefings over the last little while, that um, the key piece here is ensuring council has adequate money to buy the land that's mentioned in the motion and in the report. Uh, the uh, federal government does not uh, provide funding for uh, land acquisition. All of the rest of the bus rapid transit program can include helping to fund this, assuming that that funding comes forward. And I believe that we, I'm, I'm hopeful we will have some kind of broad announcement in principle involving the pro provincial government about that uh, shortly. But, uh, but that still doesn't solve this problem. So we're, as a council, we have to be ready in, uh, when we're talking about strategic capital planning and the capital budget next year uh, to find the money for those land acquisitions. And, uh, you know, I guess the uh, uh, final piece uh, to council would be, you know, there have been some concerns uh, raised by uh, some uh, residents, specifically the Spryfield Business Commission. And my understanding is that staff are making a presentation to their board uh, next week uh, uh, to show them what is actually proposed. Uh, and and uh, hopefully at that point, uh, a lot of their questions will be answered and we'll continue to engage them as time goes on. Most of the folks who have contacted me from the community seem extremely happy to see this go forward and like me want it to happen sooner rather than later. So I uh, look forward to hearing what council has to say and I uh, hope this motion has your support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. So, and I, I know the staff report indicates that one of my motions on the transit lanes and bike lanes uh, was sort of the, one of the origins, but I mean, we'd been thinking about this as in terms of functional plan. We hadn't, we hadn't just yet started the Bedford Road functional plan. And I was kind of frustrated that it was taking so long for Herring Cove to get here. So I moved this motion on transportation standing committee but literally, as I was moving the motion, staff is whispering in my ear, actually, we're, we're bringing uh, something forward very soon. And so uh, I thank staff for moving on this. And I know it's been a long time. Uh, consultations happen on this uh, quite some time ago now. With COVID, everything feels like a decade ago. But uh, 2019, um, uh, in terms of uh, 2018 and 2019, in terms of engagement with folks at places like the Captain's Bry uh, Center and, uh, and the surveys and online, and um, ditto everything Councillor Mason said uh, in terms of the timeline. Uh, we can't let this drag on for seven or more like 10 years. It's got to happen sooner than that. And getting moving, and I know our real estate staff are taxed. They're still trying to buy up land and get things finished on Bayer's Road so we can finish that transit uh, corridor. But we, we really do need to move on this quicker uh, than 
what I think the timeline or rate laid out in the staff report uh, indicates. And phase one is happening in District 9 from the Rotary to Glenora. And this is a particularly challenging section. It's very narrow. And uh, I do have a question uh, for staff in terms of just the, the technical details. So I know uh, Mr. McGrath is on the, on the line there. And through you, Mr. Mayor, can you walk me through the uh, intersection at Osborne and Herring Cove Road? I know the consultant originally looked at and staff were looking at a, um, uh, a signalized intersection there. It doesn't currently have one at the moment. Uh, that was uh, uh, decided against in the interest of not backing up traffic uh, for meters or kilometers in either direction. But I'm, I would still like that to be a consideration at some point in the future, especially as more traffic continues to come down. Uh, it will be critical. And at that intersection, there's a 3% super elevation. So you're kind of banking the road slightly as you're coming around and wide and I shouldn't say widening it. We're, we're, we're looking at straightening the road a little bit for better sight lines. And so between the straightening and the banking and um, the, the non-signalization of the intersection, is this in keeping with the integrated mobility plan goals that we have? So are we, are we designing this to go faster than 50? And my preference, of course, would be slower than 50, but 50 is the speed on the, on the road there. So I wonder if Mr. McGrath, uh, three, Mr. Mayor, could just speak to some of those safety issues and the um, whether or not this is in compliance with the, the goals that we're setting out in the integrated mobility plan. So McGrath. Uh, yes, uh, Harrison McGrath, Transportation Planning Program Engineer with Planning and Development. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for the first question about the signals, um, as we progressed from the functional plan to the preliminary plan, the, the signals were reevaluated um, and some traffic modeling was done there. So what we found, um, the signals, putting signals there, actually the, the biggest impact is actually um, in the afternoon traffic from the roundabout. Um, there's potential that the, the queues from signals at Osborne would actually back up all the way to and possibly into the roundabout, which could uh, could have some spillback onto to all legs of the roundabout. So that's why we recommended removing the, the full signals. Um, one thing that we did do through the uh, preliminary design was relocate, relocate the, the RA5, uh, the, the pedestrian overhead lights uh, to that intersection to, to provide a, a more direct crossing between uh, sidewalks on Osborne and uh, the bus stops in the area. Um, that, that is something that could be uh, reconsidered uh, in the future though. Um, for the super elevation, um, so I, I want to qualify it a bit. I, I'm not a design engineer, don't special, specialize in design, um, but super elevation, it's a requirement of road design that comes from, the, uh, from TAC, the Transportation Association of Canada Geometric Design Guideline. Um, so it, that's just, it's a design feature that, that, that can be required in times along curves. Um, and the, the consultant report, um, spoke to that a bit at that intersection or at that curve and in intersection, but super elevating curves is, is a, a typical thing that that's done on many other curves, even within the study area. Um, so the. What's really happening is the, the design speed for that curve is is being set at 50. Um, it, it doesn't the current curve doesn't meet the existing um, design requirements, so we're we're bringing that in compliance with with the current design guide. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if I have any time left. Um, I'll have to get you to come back, uh, Councillor. Will do. Uh, Councillor Cuttle. Oh, I'm off mute. Oh, there we go. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and uh, thank you, Harrison, for, for the presentation. Um, you know, I, I, I know that this is a complex project and it's kind of a tricky one too, because there's, you know, all kinds of different elements along this, uh, along the stretch of roadway to consider. Um, and I appreciate too, that it has been a long time in the making. So um, I am anxious to move forward with it um, along with uh, my other colleagues here. Um, I, you know, for the public, I just want to 
you know, reemphasize that the, the point we're at right now is looking at, you know, the phase one Glenora to the Rotary and that you no know, traffic lanes are going to be removed in that. And in fact, we're going to be improving the, the sidewalks and the active transit piece. Um, the phase two piece, um, I think, is also kind of really exciting. And um, I just want people to understand that the process here is that there'll be a review of existing conditions, there'll be public engagement, concept design, more public engagement um, before it comes back to council. So there will be opportunity for people to have input further understand what's being proposed. And um, I'm hoping to, to really make sure that this design is a success for, for the Spryfield community, for the businesses, for the residents, for the commuters, for the people who need to move in and around Spryfield itself. Um, you know, like Spryfield is seeing a tremendous amount of growth. We've got 2,300 already approved building lots um, and more in discussion. It's, um, you know, we need to be working on the long-term transit strategies and solutions now if we're going to have something that's viable and successful and sustainable, um, not just for the Spryfield area and not just for the commuters, but for the community as a whole, for the area as a whole, for the entire Sambra Loop. You know, and in that, for me, this isn't just about a functional plan for a road or for bus rapid transit to move people from Spryfield to downtown. It's about the, you know, it's about the entire community and the entire peninsula and how we create this so that there's opportunity for everybody to take advantage of this infrastructure. And I, I really would love to see that lens on, on phase two moving forward. Um, I know there's concerns um, from the community about, about congestion. Um, you know, the reality is that we're gonna have congestion. We have all this new development coming, with it comes people, with that comes cars. I don't necessarily think that road widening you know, increases demand. I think, you know, what we've done is approved a number of lots without an updated secondary plan and no kind of larger, you know, larger plan around our, not our active transit network in that area as a whole. So, you know, while this really focuses on Herring Cove Road, you know, we also need to be having our eye on how we can connect the surrounding communities abutting the Herring Cove Road to make it possible for people to walk there or to catch tr another transit bus there or to ride their bikes there you know if all the pieces aren't working together um i you know i don't see this as a great success so um you know safety and quality are key to success and um i just want to say that you know i believe this project needs to move ahead and i will be i will be supporting the motion and i'm looking forward to working with community and staff on the next pieces thank you Thank you, Councillor. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I certainly want to support this. This is the, the third time I've seen it now, Transportation Standing Committee and then uh, here as well. And uh, I'm happy to support that. I also want to add my support to the comments that uh, Councillor Mason and Councillor Cleary made about the timing of this and not wanting to wait five or 10 years, et cetera. And I know that's you know, it's, there's work to be done and there's funding to be raised, but I am very worried about this as I am uh, with the Bedford Highway. And Councillor uh, Cuddle just mentioned a couple of things that I was going to mention. I guess I'm still at the stage because of what I saw, both good and bad, in West and South Bedford that I, and, and hoping that we'll have lessons learned from that for Port Wallace, and you've all heard my rant on, on that, uh, is that, you know, the days of approving 2,300 lots and then coming back and hoping someday we can figure out how they can get to and from them, uh, we'll, you know, we'll stop doing that and we'll start doing it the other way around. And maybe there's opportunities for CCCs or for triggers like we saw in uh, Bedford South. You could not occupy a lot of those homes until the interchange was opened. The CCCs helped pay for it. Uh, West Bedford, we had to widen the Hammonds Plains Road before our homes could be occupied and the CCCs helped pay for it. So I'm hoping that there might be an opportunity to do this in Herring Cove, but certainly we've got to learn from this and do this properly when it comes to Port Wallace. And I guess it, the thing that frustrates me, I guess, about this or concerns me is that the cost, I mean, when we say a Class D estimate, and Class D, first of all, is is 
you know, not very accurate. And then we're talking five to 10 years and, and construction costs go up usually far above CPI. So, you know, we really don't know what the cost is going to be. And, and one would argue that the longer we put this out, uh, the, the more uh, expensive it will be as well, the way construction costs go up. So anyway, I, I'm happy to support this. I, I know it's on to the next stage, but I hope that there are other opportunities to fund this. I hope there are triggers that will be uh, linked to this as far as further development. And uh, and I hope we'll be able to do it sooner if others have said as well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councillor uh, Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Just uh, very quickly, um, I guess might be a comment uh, more than a question, but with the Osborne Herring Cove Road intersection, as Mr. Brath said, maybe this is something with the uh, moving the the RA five, or maybe even making it a, a, a half signal uh, stop instead of a uh, an RA five is something that we consider. I don't want to hold this up. Obviously, we want to get going on this, and we can deal with that later when it's actually built. Uh, but in terms of uh, staff, and my compliments to staff on this, if you look in the report and you look at Things that we're doing now in transportation planning, when we look at things like multimodal levels of service, rather than just level of service for cars, which is still what, if you look at a lot of other cities across North America, what they're looking at is, you know, are we moving enough cars through this section? And um, because of the integrated mobility plan and uh, the will uh, of council and our staff to take a different perspective, what I'm hoping is, it's not just Bedford Highway, it's not just Herring Cove Road, it's not just out in Cole Harbor. We're looking now at every single road and redesigning the Red Book and redesigning all of our existing roads saying, okay, how do we move people? How do we move people and goods? And what are the best ways to do that? And adding bus lanes, bike lanes, transport, active transportation trails. This is exactly what, and it takes a long time. I know the advocates don't want it to take as long, but if you imagine now in the next five to 10 years, Halifax is gonna look like a very different uh, regional municipality than it looks right now in terms of the built infrastructure. So I can't wait to get going on this and all the other things that we're doing. And I'm looking at Councillor or Deputy Mayor Outhit up in the corner of my screen here and how uh, big a difference this will make to the Bedford Highway as well. Uh, and so let's get going. I, I love this plan and I want to get going on it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Cuttle. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to Councillor Cleary's point about that intersection, you know, I was speaking with staff yesterday. They did say that all the elements will be reviewed. I too have similar concerns to Council Cleary that that you know I, I I'm not a road design engineer, um, but like many things, um, standards are based on you know, previous ideas of what roads were for and how they should be used. You know, traffic speed is a real consideration here. Um, you know, we know that a bus traveling along a sidewalk at 50 kilometers feels like it's going very fast to the pedestrian walking right up against that sidewalk next to the bus. You know, you know it's not just about, um, you know, book. Um, like clearing the flow for traffic to go through. It's about making sure that all the users in that right away, feel comfortable and feel safe. And you know, to my point earlier, the you know, safety and quality are really what it, are what going to define the success of this project as a whole. So, if there is that opportunity to perhaps revisit that intersection that's been flagged by some of our stakeholder groups, um, you know, I think that's I think that's us doing our due diligence to really take a look at that and make sure that it's going to work. So, um, you know, I, I'm on board with uh, Councillor Cleary on that one. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent, are you with us? Yeah. I'm trying to be, can you hear me now? We can hear you, yep. Yeah. Okay, so I've got Corey on the line, but I'll ask my question. Um, my, my main question is in re reference to the second part of the motion, <clears throat> which is around uh, undertake, where is it here? 
uh, initiate efforts to acquire property to widen the various section of Herring Cove Road to accommodate dedicated active transportation and transit infrastructure. Can you tell me what, just remind me what the process is for that and what, what will happen to this large plan if we are not able to successfully acquire it and, and is there a possibility we couldn't have successfully acquire it and then resort to expropriation? I'm just wondering what the complications are for that. Okay. Uh, yes, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, we're, we're recommending that we initiate uh, investigating land acquisition um, because that needs to take place. We need the land before um, we can begin to really get into construction. Um, and that, that can be a lengthy process. So with the overall endorsement of this plan, we as staff can kind of continue on with the process of, of uh, acquiring that land and it, it can be a lengthy process. Um, we typically begin with a, a negotiation with, with the landowner, but um, there are various methods to acquire that land and expropriation could be a tool that, that is used. Um, Thank so you, I don't Councilor, know if that answers your question. Councillor Kent? Yes, can you hear me? I can't, this is, something's gone completely wonky here. Yeah, we uh, we can hear you. You look an awful lot like Lukey Hen Henman, but we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I'm going to work on getting this resolved. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, colleagues. Seeing no other interested parties, are we ready for the question? Question. 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 Beginning with District 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. <clears throat> Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. Voting in favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. Voting in favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Oathead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. 1, Councillor Dale Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Now that my technical issues are resolved, thank you. <laughs> And two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. And that has passed. Thank you. That motion has passed. Thank you, Councillor uh, Mason. Um, colleagues, we took uh, the next item off the consent. It's 11.4 coming out of Harbour East. It's the creation of a disc golf course in uh, Dartmouth. Uh, Councillor uh, Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer 1 take no further action on the proposal for a disc golf course at the North Woodside Community Centre and 2 continue to undertake the disc golf pilot project and related initiatives and assessments as part of the municipality's ongoing and future recreation programming. Second Mancini. Seconded by Councillor Mancini. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Uh, so I, I wanted to pull this off the agenda just because uh, there's a few questions on it and um, we've had some public interest in it. Um, the, I guess I'll just start by saying I, I, I personally I was a little disappointed in the, in the conclusion of the report. Um, this particular park, uh, when, we, when it came up at uh, Harbour East, actually Councillor Kent had, had remended, or remembered dealing with it way back in uh, 2000, uh, I guess it would have been eight. Uh, when she was on council, um, it's a little it's it's a little basically section of land that is ha that currently doesn't have any sort of purpose going on for it. There there are at various times community concerns about um, you, you know accepted sort of concerns with it, and um, you know I I just look at it and it's a piece of the vacant land that we own that's next to the North Woodside Community Center where of course there are bathrooms it's on transit it's on the Harbor Trail it's actually a fantastic little piece of land that 
we just really aren't using. And so the disc golf um, proposal was one idea that had come forward as to like, well, how we could better use this piece of this piece of land that we're really uh, that's really just it, it's underused. Um, so, I, I mean, it would have been I know our parks folks that they, they have a lot on their plate planning wise. Um, it would have been nice had there, had there been maybe a, a number three to this motion um, to look at uh, future planning efforts for for this space. Um, so I'm wondering for for my first question for staff is you know like where where if not a disc golf course here like you know how do we look at this piece of property actually as as other future potential for it? Hey. Who do we have from staff? I... Uh, Mr. Mayor, Richard Harvey, Harvey, Manager of Policy and Planning. Good day, um, sir. So uh, to the councillor, the, the staff report is more so uh, in response to the proposal for disc golf. So I think the councillor's right that we didn't necessarily spend a considerable amount of attention looking at alternative uses to this site in general. Um, however, what the staff report does outline is that we think we'll all benefit from understanding uh, more of the provision of the sport, and there's quite a lot of energy and effort that's now being spent on uh, doing some evaluations. There's quite a number of programs that are underway with our recreation staff to look at this golf, and whether we return to this site after that evaluation or another is something that would be considered uh, through that evaluation period. Uh, th thank you, uh, Richard, for that. Um, I, I guess my reaction is more <laughs> is coming from a point of like, I mean, I know there's so much on our plate. We only have so many resources. We always have to we always have to be somewhat picking and choosing what we do with priorities um, and spaces. And so my just kind of just point is coming from the well, you know, if this thing, if this is not likely for this site. Um, then, you know, does this piece of land just basically sit status quo as it kind of has been for a long time? Um, I, I did have one more question for you on the disc golf piece of it all. Um, we did get some correspondence from the public about the use out in Hammonds Plains and how that has grown. Can you explain a little bit more as to how we are engaging with disc golf? Like, what does that actually look like as, as a process? Because we, we really don't have any municipal assets in this area at all. So, Mr. Mayor, at this point in time, with the actual writing of the staff report and with its submission to council, uh, there actually are a number of initiatives that are going on with our recreation staff. The, uh, even with the writing of the report, the submission of the report since the time in which it went to Harbor East Marine Drive, uh, there actually are efforts to identify a number of pilot projects uh, using existing municipal parks. Uh, so the ability to uh, for us to rent out actual equipment, have it set up as a, as a, as a bit of a pop-up in many ways for, for courses uh, are all initiatives that are underway at this particular point in time. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, I, I think I will leave it at that. Um, mainly just, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the work that's been done. appreciate the staff report. I support the conclusions of it. Um, a part of me is just disappointed because, uh, you know, it's, I see this other piece of land in North Woodside just continuing to sit there, you know, very much underperforming its potential. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, um, in looking at this and, and talking to a few of the folks, and in fact, I've talked to a number of them over the last few months uh, who, are, who are looking desperately for, uh, for disc golf space. Um, and, it's, and, you know, one of the things that's been mentioned to me several times is the fact that, you know, it doesn't have to be 18 holes. I mean, it could be smaller units in different places, uh, partly to just absorb some of the demand that's out there, but also introduce people to the sport and doing it, doing it in a way that's very you know, uh, easy, especially for, for uh, younger uh, folks. But even within my area, I mean, just around me, like Flynn Park, for example, is a great spot that is underutilized uh, in, in a number of ways and has a topography and it's got some woods, it's got some hills, it's got some flat spots. It 
curves right around. I wouldn't use lower Flynn Park because we don't want Frisbees going out on the Quinpool Road. But, uh, you know, the upper part uh, at Flynn and McDonald would be an ideal spot for this kind of thing. Throw in three or four baskets and see what happens. Tupper School. I mean, again, it goes on and on. So I'm, I really uh, am heartened to hear staff talk about, you know, looking at pilot projects, seeing what else we can do. Um, you know, it's almost... <laughs> Leisure activities and sports change. You know, I, I don't understand pickleball. It's not one of those things that I would ever play, but man, I get weekly emails about pickleball and the lack of pickleball. Um, it's a dumb name. I wish they called it something else. I might try it. Um, but, you know, it's one of these things where I didn't know people played disc golf until last year. Um, and so, and I've, I've tried it now at my friend's cottage last year. It was kind of fun. I suck at it apparently. So I'm, I'm not going to, you know, go on any national team or anything, but it's one of those things where I really think we did need to encourage more of these new things that are happening because new is always easy for, especially staff, uh, cause you get so much on your plate to say, well, we're already doing tennis. We're already doing golf. We're all, or not golf. We're already doing uh, hockey. We're doing lacrosse. We're doing soccer. We're doing football. We do all these things. We can't do another thing, but I think we always need to be doing, looking for opportunities to do new things. And I'm, I'm glad staff are doing this. I did notice though, not in the staff report coming to council, but in the staff report to Harbor East, there was an alternative that said we could tell the CAO to go do this. So I guess my question to staff is how opposed to, to this are you if, if one of the alternatives is to actually make the CEO do it uh, and plan for it in the next capital budget? So, you know, I've, I haven't been to this site, I have to admit. So I'm relying on you, the local counselor, but why, why not here? Like on a scale of one to 10, why not here? Like 10 being absolutely no way would we support this because it's there as an alternative. So I suppose someone could move that. Mr. Harvey? Well, Mr. Mayor, I think that, I think that uh, in response to the Councillor, what we're outlining in the staff report is there is a lot of energy and effort that's going in both with respect to uh, some of the disc golf stakeholders and with regards to our recreation staff already to do these types of initiatives that he's referred to. I think what we're indicating is there are all kinds of opportunities, including the ones that he's identified. Uh, let's have a little bit of a, of a go at understanding what the, some of the usage is, and then we can go and evaluate if this is the right location or if there's another one that's actually preferred. So without necessarily giving a ranking of one to 10, I think that's, that's probably the more apt response further to the staff report. And I appreciate the candor uh, and the diplomacy. Um, so I guess, you know, looking at this, you're not saying no ever, you're saying no right now until you get a better sense of it. I, Mr. Mayor, I think that's an accurate sum up of, of where we are as a, from a staff perspective. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Mancini, who I also know is the uh, president of the Pickleball Defense Committee and will probably have a response to the name. Um, Councillor Mancini. To uh, save my five minutes, I won't go into the pickleball history, Mr. Mayor, but maybe at another time. Uh, and and Councillor Cleary, come on over to District 6, so we'll get some appropriate pickleball uh, opposition for you. Um, I, I'm fully in support of uh, Councillor uh, Austin's, uh, you know, desire to do something with the Northwood uh, Woodside land. Uh, it is an underutilized space, and uh, we know being in this pandemic how important our green space is and our parkland is, and so there's a piece of our property that's really, as the councillor said, is underutilized. But the reason why I wanted to chime in is, and Councillor Cleary is quite accurate, there are a lot of great new leisure sports, pickleball being one of them, disc golf, ultimate frisbee, and the list goes on and on. And we need to utilize that as we as we build this municipality that we have now and continues to grow. One of the things that people are coming here for is that leisure activity and that not having to travel an hour or two to get to the leisure activity. We have this in our great uh, municipality. Um, so it's a great activity uh, and growing. I guess, you know, I'm glad that I hear staff are looking to do a deeper, uh, deeper look into disc golf. It's disappointing that uh, this property wasn't the one chosen, but I'm hoping when I look at the deeper look at disc golf, we need it on the dark side. I look at Councillor Purdy, she has the rehab lands, uh, which was, I think, be a perfect spot for disc golf. I know we're looking at it for an off leash dog park also. Uh, but so hope staff will look at the dark, continue to look at the dark side. 
I guess my question here is, uh, and I see Mr. Harvey on board, do we have any sense of a timeline on both items? Uh, you know, looking at the Northwood Woodside land, or, or do you need, do we need a motion for that from Councillor Austin? And the second part of that, you know, when will we get a response back with regard to that deeper look at? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor, I think what we've heard um, sort of loud and clear definitely from Councillor Austin and, and from other councillors as well is that the North Woodside location is something that should be looked at. Uh, what our suggestion would be is let's undertake this something of an evaluatory period to, to understand where we're uh, going with disc golf through this bit of a pilot project, which I think could take place over, let's say, the next year. Uh, and then uh, that'll give us a chance to reevaluate the Northwood side property. If that isn't for a variety of reasons seen as being most suitable for disc golf, we can work with a counselor then to discuss any alternatives to it or to look at the promotion of a course in that particular area. So we very much understand uh, the emphasis that's being placed upon uh, doing something with that wooded area. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Councillor Mancini, you stole my thunder. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> so I see two issues here. One is the North Woodside land and the functionality of that and what to do with that, but also the, the disc golf, is that what it's called? <laughs> never know. Is it disc golf? Yes. Disc golf, yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the new recreational uh, fun that this can provide to so many folks in our community. And I obviously, I barely can even throw a Frisbee, but uh, I think that it's a great idea. And I'm just wondering how, how would we go about, what would be the appetite of council or staff to look at our rehab lands here in Cool Harbor? Like what, what an awesome opportunity. It, we're already, staff are already looking at functionality for this land here, uh, it to park land and, you know, off leash. That's very important. We don't want to take away from our dog lovers, but it's a big area. It's, it would be perfect for something like this. And the costs are very low for a big return, huge return. And not only that, but you know, having people come from all over the municipality to play disc golf. And I mean, look at the geography. We have one in Hammonds Plains and then Cole Harbor. I mean, it's so huge to be pulling people from all over the municipality. And that would help our local business, our local restaurants, our local coffee shop, you know, people come to play all afternoon and then, you know, get dinner here on the way home. I just, I see so much potential for this. Uh, so how would you... What would you suggest uh, to, to move forward uh, with, with this idea? How Mr. Harvey? Well, further to uh, Councillor Purdy, uh, we actually have, as, as Council may remember, a, a park planning process that's going on for the rehab lands at this particular point in time. So we're, we've done some initial consultation. We're set to go out with some more. I do know that we've had uh, considerable submissions with regards to the provision of disc golf. So without presupposing what that public consultation process is going to come out with, I, I'd like to see how that sort of formulates so along with all the other, uh, you know, submissions that we're receiving for different ideas of that park plan. So what I can say at this point is it's definitely a matter that's under consideration. All right. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before you start my clock, can I get some administrative stuff done here? Because I think I missed some things while I was having problems. Um, is, there, is this motion on the floor? Because the last thing I heard, I think, was Sam saying he may have wanted to remove it from the agenda. But now we're talking about it. So the motion's on the floor. Motion's um, on the floor. Okay. So um, I, I, I absolutely want to support Councillor Austin in his advocacy to utilize the lands at Southwood side. Uh, sorry, Northwood Side Center. Um, that area was under consideration um, and certain recognized as being a, a use, uh, an unused um, property that had a lot of potential when I was on council in the past. And I and it's I I'm, it was as 
excited that as I was then at the notion that something could potentially happen there. It is a great location. There's a really good stewardship uh, community agents there and leaders in the community next door at the uh, Northwood Side Center. They've been very successful at bringing really good community um, activities and services through a, a service agreement that we have with them. And I, I see this as a really nice opportunity. So I, I hope that given the opportunity to, uh, to consider this in the future, and I understand um, Richard, why you would want to, why we should have a deeper dive into it. I agree, I agree with that. I think that all counselors here would, would probably love to have the opportunity to have disc golf or some form of, of uh, infrastructure and, and new, new uh, outdoor space in any one of our districts. I am going to for go asking for it to be considered an Eastern Passage, but I won't, I wouldn't want to miss this opportunity that we have a master plan for the Eastern Passage Commons that I would really like to see some movement on. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that for that area, but I can think of places on Baker Drive and on Mount Edward Road and, and a number of places that could benefit from it. Um, I'm, I'm still, I'm going to continue to champion for Councillor Austin because I think that, that, it, that it's a, it's a good opportunity. And did I hear right that so I have two questions. Did I hear right that this pilot, um, that you're considering a pilot at that location? Maybe I misunderstood because I might have missed some of the pre previous comments. Um, and this, uh, again, what would be a routine way to make sure that any, air, any potential areas, if it's not there, of course, I want to have some consideration in District 3. Uh, um, we, we've gone through the Eastern Passage Commons area uh, planning exercise, um, but I can think of places like Baker Drive as well. So I just, I can follow up. We can, we can do that offline. You don't necessarily have to take up council's time right now. I, I can do that, but I would want some follow up. Um, but right now, can you explain a little bit more about the pilot you just referenced a few minutes ago? So, Mr. Mayor, uh, through to the councillor, uh, the, the pilot would not be on the site because the site is is wooded. It would re require, um, you know, some capital work in which to modify it such that it could be a disc golf site. What I think is uh, what I think is new that's being highlighted in the staff report is that through our recreational uh, programming and some of our community centres, we've actually obtained uh, disc golf baskets that can readily be installed in a variety of different circumstances and readily taken down so they can be moved around, they can be established for tournaments and otherwise. So what we're really looking to do through the pilot program is to gain some experience uh, through some of the parks, uh, almost as pop-ups in many ways, or even through our recreational programming to get a bit more experience with it. And then we'll be able to apply uh, that and make determinations over the North Woodside lands or other lands and, and see about uh, implementing this further. That's all for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Diggle-Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. The uh, thing that I wonder about the most, I'm familiar with the North Woodside Community Center. DASC actually has a program that's uh, run out of there and they're run by a very dedicated volunteer board of directors as well. So whatever happens with that land, I'm just wondering about consul consulting with them about what will be a complement to the services that they provide. I do know that the parking lot is full right, when it is a beautifully well-used uh, community center. Parking lot is full. When we talk about, you know, access to washrooms and stuff like that, I get a little bit concerned, again, because it is volunteer run. And when you look at what their budget is and so public access to washrooms and where they're located um, and considering that there's a daycare in that building, there's a program for persons with disability. They do provide person support for persons who may or may not have some vulnerable attributes. And so... I, when we look at sites and we think about adjacent assets to make sure that whatever is there, that it's complementary to that asset. Um, so that I'm just wondering if they were consulted at all during the process of looking at this. So Mr. Mayor, uh, we had some preliminary conversations and the very uh, issues that the councillor is highlighting were ones that were uh, also highlighted by uh, by that board or by staff of the board, if you like. 
Um, so those would need to be matters, but they weren't looked at necessarily as, as being, no, this, is, this, could, this isn't something that could happen on these lands. It was looked at something that would, would require more consultation, uh, and that's the type of consultation that we would need to undertake uh, if we were to look at these lands for the establishment of this course at a later point in time. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Austin has buzzed in and he's probably got, I know he's very familiar with the folks there. Councillor Lovelace will go to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I'd like to invite you all uh, to Hammond's Plains to play some disc golf. Uh, Vernon Canock has built an incredible uh, course along with um, the association. Uh, you know, the equipment, as was mentioned, is available at I think three, if not four different spaces. Um, I can tell you that it is very, very well used and well maintained. There's no garbage left behind. Um, there's no, uh, you know, dog poo bags. Like people love this space. They're taking very good care of it. And I think it's uh, a testament to the association um, themselves, you know, as uh, the Nova Scotia Association, the local group, as well as the Maritimes group. So, you know, working with this um, disc, golf, disc golf group, I think it's a fantastic idea. I like the direction that staff is going in. I do feel we need a little bit more information to make sure that we're positioning ourselves, um, you know, at, at, on the, the right spot. Uh, and, and certainly that does take time, but also I think for anyone watching this conversation, please fill out the rural recreation strategy. Like we really do need to continue to continue uh, as, to, as to what it is that we need. And so uh, I, I will be um, uh, supporting uh, Councillor Austin on this. Thank you and sorry for my dog. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, good discussion. Um, so just uh, to Councillor Deagle Gammon's point about the North Woodside Community Centre, absolutely. Uh, we have a fantastic board there. Um, it's one of the best run facilities going. Um, and uh, the, the, the way this came about actually, like it generated a staff report in the first place is because of a proposal from um, maritime disc golf um, and they actually they came and they met with the with the community center board and they do have those concerns about well you know how do how would you how would you balance the parking lot you know how would access work um, but generally the board felt uh, pretty positive about it as something that would be complementary to their existing recreational activity activities that could really fit in well um, with the with what they do already there was talk about well we they could even have because their staff during the day, they could have a bunch of um, discs behind the desk that people could sign out. So uh, to lower barriers to entry even more so. So the board was board was pretty positive about it. Um, I mean, I, this site, the, 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 the one big drawback from a disc golf perspective is it is a little on the small side. I mean, it, just from a space point of view, something like Councillor Purdy's rehab lands would probably, uh, you know, you, you could fit much more there. The thing it has going for it is it's pretty hard to find a large sites in the core that are unspoken for. So uh, those are some of the thoughts behind it. Um, I'm okay with the report as it is now. I mean, I do have some reservations on it, um, but uh, I, I get the sense that this is not the end of a end of conversation about disc golf and perhaps it's not the end of conversation about this particular piece of property. So uh, I will leave it at that for now. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Question. Colleagues, are we ready for the question on this? Question. Go to the vote. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had a question in the chat for clerk, and I'm just wondering uh, if correspondence had been received because I do have a note from a resident. Well, he's not a resident, but from a Mr. Guthrie that he sent correspondence on the 17th at 9.33. I think his correspondence was just circulated. Was it in on this? Uh, correspondence was just sent out on another matter. If you just give us a few seconds, we're just checking to see if that was received. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor, I think that one was sent to all councillors, not necessarily the clerk's office from Scott. So from the looking, I do, not, I do not believe we have seen that. The correspondence you were speaking of was circulated. I, I stand corrected. We did receive it and it was circulated to council. 
Okay. Just thank you for the verification. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Not a problem. Thank you. Councillor Austin, did you have something else? Yeah. It's the quick question. Is the in the evaluation period like a, with the staff pilot, will that evaluation include looking at the actual the usage out there at Hammonds Plains as well? A quick answer, Mr. Harvey. Uh, Councillor Austin we, is on his third go here. Okay. We had actually placed a focus on looking at how the um, uh, the lending of equipment was actually going to be used at our community centers, but we can also uh, look at that usage as well. Okay. All right, uh, Ian, take us away. Beginning with District 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. A voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. Voting in favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting for the motion. <laughs> Fifteen, Councillor Russell. In favor. Sixteen, Deputy Mayor Otet. Now I'm teed off. Yes, I'm voting yes. Mayor Savage. For the motion. So that one, motion carries. Oh, oh we have, sorry, uh, this one Councillor Diggle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. And three, Councillor Kent. <laughs> the only thing I can add to those golf references is another smile. Uh, in favor. <laughs> you guys are making me laugh. <laughs> All done, Ian. That car carries. Thank you. The next item on our agenda, colleagues, has passed on consent coming out of Heritage Advisory. That was uh, 2381 Moran Street and the Registry of Heritage Property. The next one was taken off the consent agenda. That's uh, 1152, request to include 2224 Maitland Street in the registry. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll put the motion on the floor and then ask my question that Halifax Regional Council set a date for Heritage Hearing to consider the inclusion of 224 Maintenance Street, Halifax in the Registry of Heritage Properties for the Halifax Regional Municipality is shown on Max, Max 1 of staff report dated April 6, 2021 as Municipal Heritage Property under the Heritage Property Act. Thank you. Seconded. Second. Seconded by Councillor Mason, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Really quickly, and then I see Aaron popped up on the screen there. I know this is next door to the property that we approved for the rapid, the rapid housing um, uh, funding. So I'm just wondering if this gets approved as a heritage property, does that impact that property at all? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of Regional Council, Aaron Murnahan, Principal Heritage Planner through you to the councillor. Um, we did reach out to our experts on affordable housing within our regional planning division uh, through the course of this staff report just to determine if this would cause any, uh, any issues. And it was determined that it will not. Um, it is already uh, abutting a registered heritage property at New Horizon Baptist Church, which is on the, the other side of the property. And it's nice to see that the developer is uh, of that project is proposing to keep the building in place and retrofit it. So uh, there will be no adverse effects on that project uh, by registering this property. Okay, great. That, you, my, my fear was potential added cost to the, to the applicants of the housing money if they were to build. But hearing that, that I have no further questions and, and we'll support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murnahan. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. 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 Beginning with District 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Six. Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the yeah. motion. Yeah. Why? That's fine. David. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. 
Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. These virtual meetings are rather interesting. Uh, in favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Oathead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we will move to um, items coming from members of council. Councillor Daigle Gammon, explore possible land purchase for Route 55. Turn around, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the regional uh, Halifax Regional Council request a staff report regarding options and financial implications of a potential purchase of land to enable a bus turnaround at or near the new termination of Route 55 in order to enable the return of the inbound leg of Route 55 to the Waverley Road. Second. Second. Seconded by Councillor Mason. Councillor Dagle Gammon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, We've had a lot of conversation about Route 55. Um, and so the primary reason for routing the new 55 down Craigburn is that there is currently no safe place for a bus to turn around on Waverly Road. Historically, the entire subdivision has been adequately served by bus stops on Waverly Road as none of the houses between Waverly and Lake Charles are more than 500 feet from a bus stop. Additionally, removing the bus stop located in from 739 Waverly Road disadvantages those that live on the east side of Waverly Road, specifically the Linwood Wilcock area. The moving forward together plan changes to Route 55 are to shorten the route due to low ridership, thereby increasing the route times and allowing for the extension to the ferry terminal. To shorten the ride was because of low ridership. And so they said it was about five going into Craigburn. Well, at the very most pick up one person according to the surveys that were done. So a turning loop on Waverly Road would give more time for the route which is needed to fulfill its goal for the time duration of trips that create a safe spot for the bus to stop off road out of traffic if required and when at the time point. So this would give staff the direction to talk to Conrad's or any other nearby landowner in that area of Waverly Road as a possible purchase and they are interested in that conversation. Okay, hey, thank you. Councillor um, Councilor, uh, Russell? Uh, I think you missed me, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I thought that was the last one. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Austin? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, I mean, we had quite a quite a, <laughs> a a bruising debate on this one before when it came up, um, and so kudos to Councillor Digo Gammon for going going back and uh, sometimes in this in this business when you when you lose on the first attempt, um, it's be, it's best to reformulate to try and come up with something that actually is doable. And so I voted against this the first time around because you know fundamentally I don't think the concerns about um, coming into Craigburn are have all that much merit to them from the safety point of view, um, you know, stranger danger, etc. But I think there could be potential here for, you know, rooting through Craigburn from a from a uh, an operations point of view from transit. I mean, we might be better off actually having a proper turn turning uh, place out on Waverly Road. So I'm going to support this one to see what comes back. Um, it would be really interesting to see what the potential cost implications are because there is a balance to be struck between, okay, so what's the benefit operationally to having that proper turning loop compared to what the capital cost of buying that land and then building that and building that loop might be. Um, so uh, I, I'm interested in this one. I, I didn't support the first time around, but I think this this one has some merit to look at. So I will be voting in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, I also appreciate uh, that this has come back. Um, 
in, in a format where we can discuss it more more fully than uh, than we could in the budget discussions. I'm curious about it though, why it's on the open agenda instead of being in camera. Uh, this is a, a real estate transaction from everything that I've seen. And I would think that this would be something, I, I certainly appreciate uh, uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon bringing it back and, and showing support for her community and that's fantastic. Um, but I would have thought that a real estate transaction would be something that would be happening in camera. So if I could just get a response on that, please. Yeah, as I mentioned to you before, we discussed this at the agenda review. This is not a specific real estate transaction um, and it's been in the public domain already. So it wasn't deemed to be in camera. Okay, so, so when the uh, report comes back, um, if there is anything anywhere near a specific recommendation, uh, would the report come back in camera? Most likely it would. Okay, thank you. And I will also be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So yeah, this is exactly the right tack for Councillor Dale Gam to take at this point. Uh, functionally, you know, the issue before us before was uh, changes need to be made in August when the new pick comes as part of moving forward together. Do we, were we going to continue to have the uh, bus go all the way up with very few riders or, or, or have it go through Craigburn? I made my choice then, go through Craigburn. What, what we can't answer without a staff report and further uh, examination is what are the other options in terms of turning it around on the Waverly Road? And I agree with what Councillor Dago Gampton has said. This, uh, there's no functional reason beyond the physical need to turn the bus around to run it on uh, Craigburn. I have no problem with buses running in residential streets. Happens all over the peninsula, all over the regional center, all over HRM. Uh, but uh, if uh, the land is available, if an option presents itself, and if it's affordable, right? That is the other heartbreaker here is uh, there may be two or three parcels of land up and down in that neighborhood uh, that uh, maybe could be for sale. I don't know, I haven't looked at it, but if they all come back and they want a billion dollars, that's not gonna happen either. So to, to get those answers, so we have a document that the councillor can, can, can point to when she's uh, uh, getting questions from the residents, I think that's completely worthwhile and I do support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. See no other discussion. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. 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 Beginning with District 6, Councillor Mancini. A voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. Voting in favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. Voting in favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. 1, Councillor Diggle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Hensby. Absolutely affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. And five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. 11.6.2 uh, is a 2022 World Sailing Championships. Councillor Loveless. Ahoy. <laughs> now for a little post COVID uh, fun. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Regional Council request a staff report on the request from the 2022 World Sailing Championship Post Society for $1.335 million to support infrastructure improvements for the event. Second. Second Thank by you. Councillor Blackburn, Councillor Loveless. Thank you so much, Councillor Blackburn. Appreciate that. Uh, so uh, inside your package, you had all the information letter from the host society. You had uh, the breakdown of um, what is it the what it is that the uh, association, the host society, the St. Margaret's Bay Sailing Club, as well as the Hubbard's um, Sailing Club is looking for. There are um, a significant itemized numbers here. Uh, a lot of um, you know floating dock systems, various different raft, rafts, um, ramping, uh, a whole host of things. What's really mm -hmm. exciting about this, of course, is that for St. Margaret's Bay, 
this will be a lasting legacy. And, um, you know, the host society in particular uh, has done this work to get this uh, world championship bid um, because this, of course, will create uh, more opportunity for the sport in St. Margaret's mm -hmm. Bay um, and as well uh, create, uh, hopefully, more interest in young people uh, getting more involved in the sport. So I look forward to uh, receiving support from you for this and uh, welcome you to come out to St. Margaret's Bay and, uh, and enjoy um, the beauty that the Bay offers. And obviously, uh, you know, our fingers are crossed that we're going to be through this COVID um, and we'll be able to have the event. So um, I look forward to this staff report. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Oh, thank I'm you, sorry, Mr. Sorry. Mayor. I'm sorry, did I miss? Uh... No, Councillor Mason was the last one, I think. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so uh, great that the World Sailing uh, wants to come to HRM. I think it's fantastic. We all know that HRM is probably one of the best municipalities uh, in Canada to host world-class events, regardless of what Cassie Campbell says. Uh, you know, the my questions here in the staff report, I'm hoping to be answered. And what are the, you know, where is the other orders of government when it comes to supporting uh, this, this particular uh, event? Um, 1.3 million bucks is a, that's a big ticket item for this municipality to cough up for uh, an event. And typically when we have large events like that, the other orders of government are involved. Uh, will SEAC be approached for uh, funding? I know the SEAC funds are not as great as they have been in the past because of the pandemic and the hotel is not doing as well, but that's another question I'm hoping staff will include uh, in, in this report. The challenge that I have with this, this facility is not an HRM facility. I guess the, the comparison I make to Beasley Field in Dartmouth in my district, District 6, uh, we were going to host the Indigenous Games and hopefully we still will have that opportunity to do, do that. Millions of dollars was uh, included into uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, upgrading that facility uh, and other orders of government were involved. So the difference being once that event is uh, completed, we already are benefiting from those infrastructure upgrades. Uh, all communities, uh, the whole community can benefit from it. Sailing is a different, it's, it's not our facility. So I would hope when staff look at this, uh, we'll look at this club, well, the sailing, the, the yacht club will also look at uh, programs for uh, our vulnerable uh, residents. Uh, th this morning we talked to a great length an accessibility strategy. I would hope they would have a long-term program for those that are, have mobility issues and that, that exists in many boat clubs around, uh, around Canada. So I support what's in front of us today, Mr. Mayor. I just said it's a little bit different from other events where the facility is not ours. I just hope that the staff report will come back and I hope our uh, friends and colleagues from the federal government, provincial government are listening and they're gonna go open up their purses also to this event. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace, for bringing this forward. Um, I have the same, a similar concern to Councillor Mancini in terms of typically for something like this, you were talking federal and provincial commitments as well. It's uh, typically all the all, every, everyone gets involved um, for these sorts of events. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not as fussed about it being not our facility. I mean, I think I have the example right in my own district of not of, you know, facilities that are not HRM owned that are being used for hosting um, the all in the form of the canoe clubs and, you know, Atlantic Canoe Division, Canoe Kayak, right? That were the, the sprint championships are coming uh, next year in 2022. And we're contributing some major bucks towards uh, hosting that as is the feds, as is the province. Some of that includes uh, of that money is going towards rebuilding the judge's tower on Lake Bannock, which is, you know, a wholly not owned um, uh, HRM facility in any way. We, I, we don't even own the land there. I think uh, it'll touch our land, but that'll be it. Um, so, I mean, I'm not as fussed by that. Um, I think Councillor Mancini raises a good point about like, and I, 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 I'm just ignorant as to what the, uh, what the long-term, you know, 
benefit is in terms of the sport like uh i know with the with the canoe clubs um it can be looked at it's, it's like sailing in some ways is a bit of an elitist sort of sport um and i know they make special efforts right to reach out to people who would traditionally uh not feel included right in 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 that world um so i would hope that like in turn in the staff report that we can get some info back in terms of well what is the what is the give back from the sailing world in terms of, 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 of that dynamic um, for us to be contributing towards the facilities. Uh, what's the piece in terms of the federal provincial? Um, and so I, I think those are those are big, uh, big questions to that, that I'd want to know some more on. And I do have one question, Mr. Mayor, if I can ask the CEO, I know we don't ask details on us on a, a staff report request. My this question is, it's more about the request itself. With the hosting coming next year, I mean, Canoe 22, we that was awarded in 2018. It's been kind of two years worth of three of uh, planning for it. You know, the federal provincial, it's all lined up. This feels like it's showing up with, you know, very, very little time to actually do much with it um, where the event is next year. Um, can I ask, is, is, can we even turn something around on this, like uh, this, uh, this quickly? CIO, are you? Yep, it's from there through you to Councillor Austin. So this will take us, you know, likely three to four months to get something back from Fort Council. Uh, we would have to, to your point, uh, precisely, we would be engaging with the local organizing committee with federal provincial partners, potential partners, trying kind to of get a sense of their budget uh, from the from the local organizing committee where the other funding partners are. Uh, and uh, that's, we would do due diligence like we'd always do on this. It would take, you know, I would, I would argue at least uh, three to four months before we get back to council with a, with a formal recommendation. Okay, uh, if, if it can be done, <laughs> this one's up on the clock. That's all. I just know it's just from looking at it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and and thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace, for bringing this forward. Uh, you know, and I, I full disclosure, I'm not a sailor, but both of my kids have gone through sailing. Um, and, you know, to the points that have been made, especially around not our facilities, uh, Councillor Adams and I have given district capital funding to um, the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Squadron for um, an accessible wharf uh, for the able, able Sail Program or Sail Able, Able Sail? Sail Able Program uh, for disabled uh, sailors. So, you know, there are lots of reasons why we would give funding um, to nonprofits uh, who, who are doing good things in our in our municipality. Uh, similar to Councillor Austin and, and Mancini, I have questions around, you know, the, the 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 way this can be turned around, the other levels of government. I mean, it looks like 1.3 million total ask. Um, and I it's not specific in the motion, but it kind of makes it sound like we're the ones gonna give the 1.3. And I certainly don't want to give the total amount. Other governments should have to pony up for this as well. And I do have, and I know it'll come back in the staff report. I have concerns, uh, not with the, uh, the Hubbard's Waterfront uh, Association, because I'm, I'm their nonprofit, uh, as is the, um, I think it's the St. Margaret's uh, uh, Sailing Club. But Hubbard's Sailing Club is actually a private business, not a nonprofit. So I'm not even sure if we'd be able to give money to them. And for the two pieces of private land, the amount of improvements that are being requested are like a third or half the value of the land itself. So, I mean, that's major improvements on private land. So I'm not even sure if we'd be legally allowed to do that. So, um, you know, I'll be interested to see how the staff report comes back and, and what we actually can fund and what we can't fund and uh, what we should or shouldn't fund based on what our residents may have, uh, you know, accessibility to these kind of uh, venues. So anyway, I support this. Not sure what will come back or how long it'll take to come back, but uh, I know staff will uh, do their due diligence in terms of research of, of what we actually are legally allowed to do and we're not. And I think there's some things in here that we may not be able to do. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, 
I will be supporting this. I'm also interested in seeing what the staff report comes back with in terms of what we're able to provide and how we're able to provide that. I think understanding the municipal benefit here would, will be really important and there needs to be a municipal benefit. And as well as how a project like this could fit into the larger ambitions of St. Margaret's Bay and Hubbard's um, in their tourism plans. Maybe it's like providing public washrooms or some other aspect, but um, I think it's really key to, uh, to identify that benefit. Um, you know, in terms uh, of, you know, sailing, uh, not necessarily being accessible, you know, we were built, this, this entire area was built on the age of sail. You know, sailing was what we did. It was in our blood. It was, you know, how people went fishing. It wasn't, it wasn't elitist. It was really about work and, um, and transit and, um, you know, it's part of our legacy and part of our culture. And I think it's actually quite unfortunate that, you know, we don't provide more access to everybody to be out on the ocean, to learn how to sail, to, you know, continue on our legacy of, um, you know, working and being on the ocean. So um, I, I, I am going to support this. Um, I do look forward to something good coming out of it for the benefit of all. And um, thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, just quickly, uh, Mr. Mayor, so continuing on where Sean and Patty were, I mean, I've certainly given money to programs at the Bedford Yacht Club uh, in the past for kids, et cetera. The example that I'll use is the, the new uh, Atlantic Tennis Center that happens to be in Bedford Common. And uh, what we did there is we gave them some money, but in exchange for that, we negotiated. And I'm sure Denise and uh, Angela will be able to speak to this uh, when they when they get a report on the uh, on sailing was that we had discounted fees for folks. We had access for accessibility uh, programs and they're going to take their things on the road, their programs on the road to uh, uh, kids in, in neighborhoods that are uh, less privileged. And of course, they're even training uh, our instructors uh, at our uh, recreation uh, tennis programs. So I think there can be something done here to make sure that uh, we get access and have a little benefit back for our, our residents to uh, get people sailing who normally, uh, perhaps as Patty said, you know, we'd like to continue that tradition, but may not have had the wherewithal to do so. So I, I will be supporting this and I just, I hope that Denise and uh, Angela will look at what happened in the, uh, the tennis facility here as an example of what could happen. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. And I am a sailor or, or I was some 40 years ago, um, back in the uh, age of square riggers. Um, so I am absolutely in support of the World Sailing Championships. Uh, I am concerned about this request though. And because of the same reason that uh, Councillor Cleary mentioned, uh, this would be uh, not a small amount of money going to a private organization, uh, I think. I think it's going to a private organization. I looked up uh, the um, I looked up the uh, Hubbard's Community Waterfront Association in the Registry of Joint Stock Companies. That's all good. Looked up the Hubbard Sailing Club, and it looks like it was a for-profit corporation that was last uh, in business six years ago. And I wasn't able to find the St. Margaret Sailing Club. So I'm concerned about that. Um, I'm it, I have no problem with the staff report. But I hope that a lot of attention would be given to where the money is going and if we are allowed to do it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't normally speak to staff requests, but just a couple of words, because I think, um, first of all, I want to commend the organizers, the people who went out and won this, because they had to go and compete internationally. I know I wrote letters and did videos and things like that in support of their bid. Um, so I certainly support the um, the request for this. There's a lot of questions, sure there is, yeah. What are the other orders that the government doing? I know the province has committed a quarter million towards operating costs of the actual event, um, but yeah, there's other orders of government that we need to figure out what, what they're going to do. Um, but think about this folks, that in 2022, Halifax will be the home for uh, freshwater aquatics and saltwater aquatics. We will have the World Sailing Championships and we will have the World Paddling championships in HRM. And that's an awesome thing for us to have. So there's a ton of questions. I've already, I know that Denise is looking at what would this mean and is it, are we allowed to do it? And 
you know, this is a this is a request that you know there's varying ways of degrees of support. I would also say in terms of disability, you may recall that Nova Scotia, Halifax hosted the World Disability Sailing Championships at the squadron in 20, I don't know, 14 or 15. It was a huge, hugely successful event and really um, put put Halifax on the map in terms of um, disabled sailing and our commitment to uh, disability sports. So it was uh, uh, it was pretty awesome. So looking forward to this. Commend the people that went out and won this. It's going to be a great year on the water coming out of COVID in 2022 for the Halifax Regional Municipality. Um, Pam, do you want to? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Councillor Lovely, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so just a couple of things. Uh, if, if we are, you know, concerned about funding uh, properties that are not HRM owned, then we wouldn't be funding a lot of our nonprofit associations, such as our community buildings. Um, so I think it's important for us to think about, uh, you know, the, the support that we give to nonprofits, including a discussion that we're going to have with Council Puddle around nonprofit uh, housing. So, um, you know, I do think that we're looking for the benefit overall. Uh, we're talking about investing in our communities and nonprofit uh, associations in the sport of sailing, as well as the recognition of the extremely important tourism industry that exists in St. Margaret's Bay that will soon come back uh, post COVID. Um, and I and I do want to give a shout out, as, as the mayor has just said, to staff, uh, Denise Schofield, um, Discover Halifax, Ross Jefferson, they were very heavily involved in this bid and working with the host society and all the different groups that are engaged in that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do hope that um, it, the staff report comes back and clearly identifies um, the funding that's coming from ACOA, the funding that's coming from uh, the provincial government. The premier has already supported uh, $250,000. You know, so there's there's lots of opportunity for this little bit of time. And part of the problem and, you know, good point about timing. But part of the issue is COVID. Uh, so we had to wait until the bid was actually through and successful. And, uh, you know, it's just unfortunate with timing, but here we are. And uh, staff is already well prepared to move this forward. As I said, they've been quite engaged so far. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleague? Uh, Ian. Question. Beginning with District 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. For the motion. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Uh, in favor. 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. And 6, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Okay, that motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. We'll go to motions, colleagues. Uh, 12.1, Councillor Cuttle, Affordable Housing Grant Program. Councillor Cuttle. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council request a staff report detailing the financial implications and scope for expanding the Affordable Housing Grant Program to include affordable housing developments outside of the regional center by registered not-for-profit groups or charities beginning in 2021-22. I, I, I heard Councillor Hensby first, but there was a bunch of them. Go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so, um, Where's my notes here? Um, yeah, so this is, um, you know, I think I think we've all acknowledged that that we do have a housing issue in HRM right now that, you know, is across across our region, and um, you know, not only do we find ourselves also in a really hot real estate market, um, we know that we have record low low vacancy rate, and we continue to watch as um, rents 
climb and climb um, every day. Um, in fact, you know, as a municipality, we've even benefited from this and that, you know, we've seen our assessments go up and, and we've seen deep transfer tax come through, more deep transfer tax come through. And I think in a, in a few years, those assessments will also benefit us as well. Um, so when it comes to affordable housing, I just feel that we need as many tools in our toolbox as possible to address our, to address the needs around affordability, choice, access, um, and all the rest of it, you know, so along with pursuing inclusionary zoning from the province and working with the private sector, I think it's super important that we support our not for profits and charities as being part of the solution. Um, we know that housing created by these types of organizations often fill in the gaps for our most vulnerable and hard to house uh, residents. And um, it's not just about addressing housing in one particular part of the city. This is really about addressing the need for affordable, supported, temporary, long-term housing needs across the municipality. And there are also groups right now that are willing and able and ready to make projects happen. Um, and you know, these groups, these not-for-profits and these charities, they are like they're key players in in um, in developing affordable housing across a broad spectrum of need. I, I heard a great quote recently that, you know, we don't rise to our highest goals, we fall to our lowest systems. And I know some of my colleagues have raised concerns that housing is not our responsibility, that we should be investing our, our money where, you know, our, we do have responsibility and, and where things are needed. But, you know, to that I say as city managers and as city stewards, housing is one of those basic and fundamental elements of what makes a city. And the availability and quality of housing reflects our collective well-being and impacts the success of our city. Um, I also know that some are concerned that the ASK does uh, not include the regional center. And you know, to that I point out that the regional center already has a fund in place to provide grants to charities and not-for-profits um, through a density bonusing program. And my first choice would be to see that program expanded throughout the rest of the municipality, but we know that's not gonna happen for a number of years. We need action sooner than that. Um, this request is really to look at a stopgap measure to help move some projects along now in areas of need throughout our municipality. And um, the request is to look at options for funding until a mechanism similar to the density bonusing and the regional center can be implemented more broadly. I just wanna finish by saying I thank all the organizations who have taken the time to submit correspondence um, in support of this motion. And I ask my council colleagues to support, yeah, to support this motion too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am happy to support this. I thank Councillor Cuddle for bringing it forward. I was just looking through my piles because I had had it on my list as well to do. So you've just saved me some work. I'm all in for uh, something. I think your uh, denotion of it as a stopgap is is correct. We are in a crisis. We are we are should not be limited to the the funding and support for agencies and groups that are working out hard in the communities to find solutions to funding through not-for-profit organizations and right now that's our only alternative so this is a good i think this is a good uh, a good start i hope that whatever staff report comes back and if if this is not the way to go then they maybe perhaps can make some recommendations or come to us offline and say you know look this is a work with us program, in my opinion, it's like, um, come to us with maybe some other alternatives to put a motion on the floor that does move something forward that we can create. The point here is, there are agencies and groups who are ready to do good work in our communities to address housing, and they cannot have this, they do not have the same playing field, they cannot get off the ground. This makes me recall the first contract that I took after I left politics in 2013 with Ocean View Continuing Care. Ocean View Continuing Care had a, a great plan 
to uh, expand on their infrastructure in the on, on uh, Caldwell Road here at Eastern Passage for an independent living option for seniors that mimics something like they see on Baker Drive, but was more perhaps hopefully more affordable. Their whole plan was worked around affordability. So it didn't have to break the bank for families who have often in some of those other locations are are um, supporting seniors through a, a collection of of siblings who are pooling money and that that was not sustainable yet our seniors are in positions where they need to have uh, alternatives to going into uh, structured environments like long-term care that's just one example they had to mothball that that's that was disappointing and they sorry that's my puppies are speaking to this motion as well um <laughs> they they had to mothball it for a little while but i'm understand i get the impression now that they're starting to look at it again i can't support i can't urge you enough to say we need to find a solution we need to capitalize on good energy that's out there now and i look forward to seeing this report and ask everyone to support the uh the uh, work that staff can do to get us ready for some a, a bit of a change. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am very supportive of this of this concept. I think I'm a little bit, bit confused in that uh, the affordable housing grant is specifically tied to um, the incentive uh, and bonus zoning. So I'm I'm just not quite sure whether or not we should be zeroing in on um, looking at supporting affordable housing uh, grant throughout all of HRM or just outside of the regional center and wondering whether or not this is actually a new grant program, you know, that will, that will not coincide with the current grant program that exists. Um, because I'm, I'm not, I, I guess I'm just wondering whether or not staff can speak to that um, because the AO is tied, uh, the respecting the, the grants for affordable housing is tied directly to the incentive voting in the regional center. Okay, well, we don't have staff. I, I can ask the CAO Jacques Dubé if he has any thoughts on that at this point. Otherwise, it would have to be answered in the staff report if, assuming the motion passes. What Jacques, any thoughts on that? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I, you know, unless unless Kelly Dendy's on the line, I, I would defer to Kelly on that question or her team. Or we'll, we'll certainly put it in the answer to the question in the staff report. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, no, that's fine. I, I I'm just uh, I'm not. I mean, I know as Councillor Cuddle had just said, you know, this is uh, we're not going to get bonus zoning in, in the regional plan anytime soon. There's there's no magic wand. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out how we would actually expand a grants program um, when it's tied specifically to uh, the regional center, unless, of course, we, you know, unless Councillor Cuddle is um, amenable to uh, a friendly amendment to actually remove the term uh, regional center, uh, you know, from this motion and just uh, replace it with throughout HRN. Right. Any of my other colleagues have any comments on that? Second. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Just, just really quickly, that was that was seconded. So is that from the is that on the floor? No, that sure wasn't. Uh, I didn't hear that as an amendment. Uh, it, it, we'll hear from Councillor Cuddle again. She's going to come on again. Okay. So just just to be clear, so the the if that's the friendly amendment, Councillor Cuddle will speak to that at her at her when she closes. Well, it's not. I didn't hear any amendment or second in uh, uh, policy there, but. Um, so, I'm going to yeah. look at Councillor Cuddle. Are you, are you open to that as an affirmative amendment? Um, you know, I talked to staff about this in crafting the motion. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the regional centre has its funding mechanism in place. And what we're looking for is an alternative to that, an alternative source of funding. So my understanding is that it would be, it would be separate. Um, but again, I think this would have to go back to like, you know, why we're requesting this funding, why we're requesting the staff report to look at funding. Okay, that doesn't sound like a, a friendly amendment. Councillor Smith, go ahead. Right, yeah, I just want to make sure because I did hear a second and I did hear uh, Councillor Lovely put that into like motion form. So I just want to make sure that I, did, I wasn't speaking. Did I miss before. that? I didn't hear that as a motion or? I suggested it would be a friendly amendment, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Okay, but it's not. It's, I don't know. Is saying it's not a friendly amendment. 
Go ahead, okay, Councillor Smith. Yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, really quickly, in, in Councillor Cutter, when you come back, you can you can probably speak to because my question was similar to to Councillor Lovelace, understanding that our current affordable housing grants program is, as mentioned, tied to the density bonusing program. So I guess one question is, do you envision this um, to be to be something that is new, which was already asked, or would we be using our current model of of using the the formula within the regional center that then puts the money into the pot for the affordable housing fund that then we would use that that pot within or yet yeah, within hrm and, and wider than the regional center so just want to get an understanding of your vision um, obviously the staff report will talk about options but when you wrote this motion from what you envision do you see this coming from the current pot or creating a new pot which either would mean we'd have to add money to the budget which we, we did for our current project or, or program, um, or would this be a new co program that we established? So I'll, when you come back, I'll let you speak to that, but I'm just trying to get a better understanding of how you envision this would look. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hensley. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor and Council. Yeah, I'm in support of this motion and perhaps uh, when the staff will review it, perhaps it could be a percentage of all the building permits that would be an issue, uh, perhaps an allocation of 1% or 1.5% could be allocated to an affordable housing fund program to assist uh, not-for-profit uh, organizations that want to put in uh, affordable housing uh, uh, units. I know that on the Eastern Shore, I got a, a proposal in Sheet Harbor, one in, and, and also one in Oyster Pond, another one that we also heard last week from uh, two weeks ago, the Akuma property on, on, on West Ball have components of uh, affordable housing uh, in that. So hopefully we can find a way to make this happen because uh, since we've been drawn into the game of, of housing, we better find a way to fund it. And uh, that's the only way, you, if you're gonna be in it, you must be in it all the way. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so looking at the motion, I mean, I, I think I think I can support it um, because it is looking for options at this point, right? You know, when the staff report comes back, I might have some different feelings on it. Um, I, my, my concern is just coming from the point of like, you know, how we got to where it's, it's the potential exclusion of the regional center. Because I mean, the where we are now is the density bonusing uh, money we call it a density bonus, you could call it a fee, you wouldn't be far off to call it a tax, right? It is money that we collect from private developers that then we're taking in. Uh, some of it goes to other things like, you know, park improvements or whatever, other stuff in the neighborhood, but the bulk of it is going into affordable housing. So it's going back out to nonprofits in the regional center. Um, so that money's collected in the regional center. Um, if we're then creating a, a bigger fund, and we, we definitely do need to do something uh, that um, encompasses you know, the, the rest of HRM. Um, if we're gonna do that, um, if the regional center is then excluded from that fund, basically you're then saying to all the, to, to the developer who's building on you know, the one side of the line there on Dutch Village Road, well, if you just built on the other side, you'd pay this fee basically once versus twice, because if, it's gonna, if this fund is gonna come out of general taxation, then the regional center is paying twice for it. Um, and so I have some concerns about that just from, just from a fundamental fairness point of view, like if it should be excluded. I mean, if we're going to do one of the, one of the criticisms that came from the developer side of the coin, when we were debating density bonusing, um, was that, well, you're going to charge us, but you're not putting anything into the game yourself. Right. And it's at the time it was, yeah, that's a fair criticism. There is no uh, money going into density bonusing from general taxation. It is 100% what the money that we can tax off of the developers specific projects. That is uh, what we have for affordable housing right now. Um, so that was a concern that was raised actually during that point. So, you know, maybe there's an option here to revisit that in the same in, in, as part of this process. Um, because if we are going to start using general, a more general, larger targeting of grant money out there, then, um, you know, I, I, I think 
I, I think it would be wrong to be excluding the regional center from that. Um, one of the pieces that I think this report should also consider is what a timeline for maybe uh, for for an actual um, density bonusing type setup for beyond the regional center might be. Uh, I agree with Councillor Cuddle. It probably is far too long off, but it would be worthwhile <laughs> to have staff actually consider that alternative. Um, when there is a will, sometimes there is a way. I mean, we've seen a couple of regional amendments on land use bylaws, secondary suites, hopefully soon chickens that it previously might have been said would be, a, well, that's an impossible approach to do. So maybe there is something that could be done here. I'm not sure. Um, so because there's so many unknowns, I'm okay asking for the staff report, but uh, you know, I would caution Council to not conflate the regional center money is some kind of special money that's uh, that that the regional center is getting as some bonus for for housing. That is money that is being taxed off of development in the regional center. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Mute button. There we go. Uh, thank you. Well, Sam, Councillor Osmond just basically said everything I was going to say. You know, my concern is if we're trying to balance the regional center versus the uh, non-regional center, because the regional center has what, to my mind, is a community benefit uh, funding model from uh, density bonusing that uh, we have said to people, we're not going to fight anymore about where tall buildings are. We're going to allow tall buildings in these centers, density to happen on these corridors, but we're going to get a community benefit. And sometimes a third of that could be public art or environmental or a bunch of other stuff. But two thirds of that is going to be affordable housing. And why did we keep it in the regional center? And as I said before, we even talked about trying to keep it in the neighborhood that generated it because we wanted to make sure that we saw direct investments back into the neighborhoods where the new buildings would be because the new buildings will inevitably have higher rents. They will have the highest rents or they will have the highest purchases because they're purchase prices because of the new buildings. And so because the province doesn't have a program to allow us to require affordable housing in these new buildings, uh, we wanted to take money and try and invest that back in not for profits in those areas. So I guess I can vote for the staff report, but if it came back and said the entire pool of HRM including the regional center, where 44% of the assessment of all of HRM is, is going to fund this program, and it's only going to be spent outside of the regional center. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. Yeah, the density bonusing is designed to be a community uh, offset for the uh, density that is being put into the peninsula to accommodate uh, you know, 50 to 60,000 more people over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, but I am all for taking general tax revenue and putting in, in, into uh, you know, a modest amount for matching funds for affordable housing for federal and provincial programs. Um, but if we're gonna say it's everywhere but the regional center, uh, then maybe it should be a local improvement charge or, or a, a LIC and not be charged on the regional center, right? I mean, that, that would be, to me, that would balance it out. Right now the regional center is paying this money and it's only in the regional center. I don't think that's what we're talking about here. I think what we want is we, we would want to see uh, uh, all of the region, all taxpayers contributing to this fund and that it would be available everywhere in the region. So, you know, uh, I again, I would ask if, uh, you know, uh, an amendment uh, would be considered. And I suppose I'm just going to put it on the floor and we can test council and see how it goes. So uh, my proposed amendment would be that simply that we strike the words, uh, where is the report here? Uh, how about we strike the words outside the regional center from the motion? So I move that motion, that amendment. I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. So that's so, moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Lovelace, that we strike the words outside of the regional centre. So we can vote on that if we must. I would hope that it would be friendly. The staff report can come back and talk about all the different ways we can structure it based on this discussion. But going into this saying, as it's structured right now, that we're going to tax the entire region, but only part of the region can benefit, I think is fundamentally different from saying only this one area of the region will be taxed and they're going to benefit from it, which is the case of density bonusing. So uh, I would ask for your support in the amendment. I look forward to hearing discussion on it. Thank you. So, well, first of all, let's just see, is that considered a friendly amendment, Councillor Cuttle? Um, I don't know what's considered a friendly amendment or not. I mean, I'm willing to have a discussion on it. 
so if we if we say yes, do we get to debate this amendment or is a friendly amendment just means we're just I'd rather have a discussion about it than see it as a friendly amendment. Okay, so it's not a friendly amendment. So the amendment is on the floor then. And um, so I have, uh, oh yeah, uh, on the, um, uh, Tom. So, so on the amendment, I have Councillor Cleary, Councillor Kent, Council, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Lovelace, are you on the amendment too? I think Councillor Lovelace, Councillor Russell, Councillor Cuddle. Okay, so I have on the amendment, on the main motion, I have Councillor Russell and Cleary with Councillor Cuddle coming back for a second time on the main amendment, on, on the main motion. On the amendment, I have Councillor Cleary, Councillor Kent, Deputy Mayor Lovelace, Russell, and Cuttle. So, Councillor Cleary is the first one on the amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you, colleagues. So, this is interesting. Um, I think it's six one way, half a dozen the other, and, and I'll tell you why I think that. So when I read the motion, it doesn't speak to intent, it doesn't speak to anything else, and I don't know what the intent is, if it's just to um, have only this spending in outside the regional centre, but it doesn't say that ex ex explicitly. So I think what Councillor Cuddle is getting at is, if you look at, I'm looking at the administrative order here, um, 2020 uh, 0088M, and because of the, the charter changes that the province provided for density bonusing and the way our program is set up, money raised, as Councillor Mason said, in the regional center by the development tax, if you want to call it that, um, is spent for affordable housing and some minor benefits, uh, community benefits uh, outside of affordable housing in the regional center. And it has to be because nobody else has a density bonus. So structurally and, and just from the, the way the program is set up and philosophically, that's the way it is. I think what Councillor Cuddle is saying is, look, we need housing everywhere and groups can already come to us, you know, whether it's the hospice or the Y or a nonprofit uh, housing group could come to us and say, council, we have a request. Will you please give us a half a million dollars to do this? And we could consider that at council and do it, but we don't have a program set up. And so I think what Councillor Cuddle is saying is either could be part of this administrative order, although I suspect it'll be a separate idea, uh, administrative order, because we would also on the reserve fund side need to keep things separate because that money that is raised in the regional center has to be spent in the regional center that comes from development. But we can put money in as a municipality. We can take general tax revenue or we can raise a special fee and we could say, this is for affordable housing and let's spend it. I don't think staff would come back with a report and say you could only spend that in the re outside the regional center as a recommendation because that would be inherently unfair if it's raised from everyone. Councillor Mason's point about an LIC, sure, but I, I think we've gotten away from LICs and I'm not sure we'd really want to go down that road, both from an accounting point of view, but also then pitting one group of residents against another group of residents. And so I will support the amendment, but I don't think it matters. I think the original motion isn't exclusionary. It's just saying, look, we're, we're right now excluded. Let's open it up to everything outside of that. And um, so and I, I look forward to, I hope Councillor Cuddle speaks to the amendment uh, because I don't think that was her intent. And I certainly wouldn't support her motion if I thought that was the intent. I think it's just about fairness and saying, look, right now we only have one program that serves one area. Let's have a bigger program that serves every area across HRM. And so I... I you know, again, I can support this, but I really don't think it makes a difference. I think it's the same either way in terms of what will come back in the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Traves, your smiling face appeared. Did you wish to say something Mr. at this point? Yeah. Well, Mr. Mayor, I think Councillor Cleary has sort of hit the nail on the head to some extent that, um, you know, the concern as it's expressed is the, you know, with respect to the use of the regional center density bonusing monies, and, and by, ex, by referencing an expansion of the affordable housing grant program that, that causes that occurring, I would suggest that it, a, a better approach might be to talk about uh, 
uh, staff report detailing the financial implications and scope for expanding support for affordable housing to include affordable housing developments outside of the regional center. Um, and so in that way, you're actually looking at how could we support uh, affordable housing outside the regional center in, and that may or may not uh, reference the existing um, uh, grant program, which is tied, as I understand it, to the regional center density bonusing. So that would be a suggestion that uh, I think might solve the problem and lead to a staff report that is a little bit broader than, than potentially tied to those monies, which are coming out of the density bonusing in the regional center. Okay, so I'm not quite sure what you were saying though, John. I, I didn't, I, I thought you were just going I, back. So my, my suggestion would be rather than the proposed amendment that if there's a concern over the, over the language that instead of it reading the affordable housing grant program be expanded, that in fact you expand simply support for affordable housing. So in, in the second line where we talk about expanding the affordable housing grant program, it, it, if that's, that seems to be the concern that I'm hearing from council, um, it may be better to simply refer to expanding support for affordable housing, which is a more general term. Okay, so the motion on the floor is not that though. Correct. Councilor Mason, your motion is on the floor. Do you have any inclination to change your motion? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that works for me. We just wanna have some crystal clear clarity here so that right. we, uh, you know, that, that these confusions are addressed now. So I could withdraw my motion or I could change my amendment, whatever the process would be at this point. So, so let's, just, let's just play the game of what Mr. Traves has suggested. Is everybody on council comfortable with an amendment that would say, that would take out yes. uh, the housing grant and expand affordable housing? And just say uh, expand affordable housing, correct, John? Correct. I thought you said expand support, support. for affordable Expand housing. support for affordable housing. Right, okay. Sure. Is that okay with you, Wade? Yep. Uh, Patty, Councillor Cuddle, is that okay with you? Yep, that works so for me. So if that's the case, then you you withdraw your amendment, Councillor Mason? Yep, works. Councillor Cuddle considers that a friendly amendment. So yep. we can go back to the, so let's just get, Ian, is let's it fair see, to ask you to put the, the new wording? There you go. Everybody have a look at the chat. Halifax Regional Council requests a staff report detailing the financial implications and scope to expand support for affordable housing to include outside of um, to that would jump right down to housing. outside. Yeah. Does that suit you, uh, Councillor Mason? Um, there we are. The second one. Yeah, I think that's that that means that it's not going to be talking about expanding the density bonusing money. Right. Uh, it talks about looking for ways to do that, and it doesn't preclude having a program from general revenue that would go across all the municipalities. Right. So, yeah, that's fine. That's fine with Councillor Mason. Uh, and the seconder of your motion, Councillor Lovelace, that's okay to withdraw that motion. AOC. Councilor yeah, that works for me. Thank you. Did you say AOC from uh, New York? A okay. Sorry, I, I thank you. And Councillor Cuddle, you're okay with that as a friendly amendment? I'm okay with that as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Mayor. John, you were helpful. I don't mean to sound surprised. I, it was very good. Thank you. It happens occasionally. <laughs> so, um, so we can go back to the. This has been amended in a friendly manner. So we don't need any more speakers on the amendment. So I'm going back then to the original speakers list, which includes Councillor Russell and Councillor Cleary. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Uh, I was originally looking at this and considering it um, from a number of different perspectives. One of them is, is housing is outside of what we should be dealing with as a municipality. Uh, it, is, it is in the provincial scope. So I, so I wasn't entirely in favor of it. Um, the second one is when I looked at the original motion, uh, when I look at the amended motion, uh, I didn't see a funding source and, and I didn't see discussion of it, but it is, it is uh, requesting a staff report. So I hope that the staff report would, would include uh, the, funding, the funding source for that. 
Um, I, I will be supporting this motion. With the discussion that we're seeing about the regional center versus not the regional center, one of the things that, uh, that I'm seeing quite a bit is much more broadly, regional center versus outside of regional center. And I would hope that we would be able to work towards eliminating that divide. Un unfortunately, it, it is uh, pretty significant right now. Um, I, I do support it for being outside of the regional center because we've got the, uh, the center plan, building it into the regional center. And unless we want to unpack and repack the center plan somehow, uh, this would be something that affects the rest of us. Uh, it would be nice to see the density bonusing uh, with the affordable housing supports outside or all across HRM. It already exists in one place and it's fairly tightly bound. So to provide it to somewhere else, having a separate program funded separately, probably outside of the regional center only, I think is the way to do it. And so I will be uh, supporting this motion and uh, thank you, Councillor Cuddle, for bringing it forward. Um, this has been uh, a discussion that a number of us have had for quite some time about us not being able to, uh, to have this. And, and so thank you very much for, uh, for this and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cleary, I think has said his piece uh, before. He's taken his name off, thank you. Councillor Cuddle, did you wish to have a final word on this? I was on there, Mike, Tim. I'm sorry. Councillor Outhead. Yeah, thank you. And, and hopefully this will be fairly quickly. I, I think we, for quick, we, we know how we got into this situation, that so far the province has only allowed us to do bonus density. And one of the things that we're allowed to do with bonus density is to raise money to come up with affordable housing within the, the regional centre. So we, we know how we got into the situation. So as, as Patty has said, and John, everybody, we're looking for a way to, to uh, expand the support uh, uh, you know, outside of that area. And that's great. Um, it's no secret that I'm not a big fan of us collecting the funds and then brokering them later. What I want is inclusionary zoning. I don't want separate buildings built. I want inclusionary zonings throughout HRM in every building having affordable units. And frankly, it's nobody's business which the affordable units are within those buildings if we get to that stage. And I think the province is probably going to get, get us to that stage. I'm also quite happy that if the province allowed us uh, eventually to do bonus density outside of the regional center, although I agree with Patty that that could take a, a while to happen. What I'm wondering is, and I understand why, and, and John, maybe you can answer this, or maybe Jacques, I understand why the bonus density applies only in the regional center right now. And I understand that ideally we want to use the money generated there in the regional center. Although one also knows that usually your regional center of any city is where your most expensive property, your most expensive developments, your most expensive homes and condos and apartments are. So if we wanted to expand this and look for a funding source, did we decide or did the province decide that the money absolutely had to be spent in the regional center if it was raised in the regional center? The example I look at this, if we suddenly build a subdivision in the rural or suburban areas, we collect parkland dedication money, if, if we had parkland acquisition money, if you will, from that area. Sometimes we get a playground, sometimes we get a park, sometimes we get money in lieu of that. We do not say that it has to be spent in that neighborhood. We do not say that it has to be spent in rural or suburban. We could, could it not be used to, you know, it was raised in the suburbs, could it not be used to expand something downtown? So I guess what I'm wondering is, if we wanted to raise the money in a certain area, through bonus density, but spend it elsewhere. Is that something that is within our ability to change? Or do we have to go back to the province the way we have to go to the province to get the ability to actually expand the program outside of the regional center and of course, inclusionary zoning. So I don't know if John or Jacques can answer that for me. We may be overcomplicating this is what I'm worried. John, is that uh, something you can answer? Mr. Mayor, it's Jacques here. I, I think, uh... Eric Luchik is on the call. He may have the answer to that at his fingertips or John would. I believe it's in our purview as, as council to, in your purview as council to, to make those determinations. But I don't know if Eric has anything to add to that or at least I believe he's on the call. 
Eric, are you there? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, wasn't expecting to be pulled in. I was mostly interested in hearing the discussion here today, but I can offer Surprise. what I can, and uh, maybe John, maybe John can uh, can jump in. But uh, so we we established through the uh, center plan uh, the density bonusing program for the regional center, and it was it spelled out very much directly to spend the funding in the regional center. Um, the difficulty with expanding the kind of program into outlying areas such as the uh, the suburban areas or the rural areas is that you have to look at your zoning provisions and what permissions are there and and what is considered uh, bonus and what is additional density. And so that's why we've tied any future expansions to the program to the suburban plan or to uh, uh, the rural planning uh, um, bylaw simplification program. So so that's why we've looked at this and we we were there to help uh, Councillor Cuddle to draft this motion and uh, you know, we'll be there. Uh, I, I, I feel that this is, is something that ultimately we'd ask that uh, the, the direction come back and staff can respond to, to these questions to the report. So, uh, but happy to answer any other questions I can while I'm here. Well, uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Mayor. But I guess what I'm wanting, to, my, my point was that if we're, said, and I support this, mo or this motion, and I support what uh, John has had us add to this, but one potential funding source for this, in theory, could be changing our own rules to say if we've raised money in the regional center and there's a very worthwhile project in a suburb, in theory, we could change the rules to allow that. Is that correct? The province would not have to agree to that. That would be correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay. You can change right. that if you wish. Oh, there's something for us to think about. Okay, thank you both. That's thank you all. Obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, oh, there's a lot to respond to here. Um, you know, really, this is about um, not the regional center, outside the regional center. It's about the fact that we're in a housing crisis. There's great need for housing. And um, yeah, I, I, I would love to expand the program. I'd love to have exclusionary zoning. But even with exclusionary zoning, you know, the not-for-profit sector and the charity sector provide a special kind of affordable housing. And it's one tool that we still need, even if we have those other things, we still need to support our charities and our not-for-profit housing providers because the type of housing they supply, whether it's supported housing or housing for, you know, people who are, you know, hard to house, um, is it, very, it's very specific and it's very important that, that we see that happen. When I talk to the charities and housing providers, um, you know, kind of in thinking about this motion, you know, they would say they wouldn't look at the regional center for a project because the cost of housing is, is just too high. They're actually looking to where land is cheaper, where properties are cheaper because they have limited budgets. So, you know, well, I understand, you know, the, the cost of housing in the regional center is more and that's where support's needed. Right now, we need support everywhere. And, um, you know, and I just see this as one more thing to complement the secondary suites, to complement, you know, the density boning down, downtown, to complement, you know, all the other work that we've done, you know, the tax rebates, you know, all of these things. Um, to show that we're doing our, our part in our city for our residents in taking housing seriously. It's a fundamental need. It's a, it's a huge, you know, housing is not a luxury. It's a, it's a, it's a need. And, um, you know, I think anytime we have the opportunity to support housing, we should be doing it, particularly in this, in this kind of area of need. The, the charities and the not-for-profits, you know, they said this is important to help them leverage other levels of government funding. Um, help them get projects off the ground, help them secure pro land that they might not otherwise be able to access, um, you know, given kind of the short order that's needed to, to purchase land. So, you know, I think, um, I think the amendment that John, Mr. Traves has uh, suggested suits the purpose. It's really about um, the people and those organizations who are working hard to support people in house in and their housing needs, and um, and that's the main intent behind this motion. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Yeah, question.
Beginning with District 8, Councilor Smith. Four. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councilor Morse. Voting in favor. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor. 13, Councilor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Oathit. Yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councilor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. We're voting in favor of the motion. And seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Councilor Cuddle. Colleagues, it being 10 past three, we'll take 15 minutes and come back at 325. We'll be back at 325 on the dot. Just a reminder, we will be muting your microphones and blanking out your cameras until we return from the 15 minute break.
Good afternoon, everyone. It is now 325. We'll be returning your microphones and your cameras. And Mayor Savage, we are ready to begin the meeting again on your call. Okay, just looking to make sure that uh, Councillor Cuddle is on the call. There she is. Yep, let's go. Are we live, Ian? Yep, we are live and ready to go when you're ready. Okay. All right. Welcome back, the colleagues. We're going to move ahead with the council. The next item on the agenda is 12.2, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council request a staff report on the request for an increase to the grant provided by HRM to the Halifax Tars Rugby Club for an additional $150,000 due to the increased costs as outlined by the group. Um, this ask comes- I will, I will second that, Councillor Russell. Thank you. Oh, thank Seconded you. by Councillor Russell. Councillor Cuddle, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this ask comes as the Tars Rugby Club faces a number of um, significant new challenges that uh, were not foreseen in the original ask. Um, I just want to note that they've already raised $1.05 million for this project, but the challenges that they've encountered recently is that um, the soil, because the site is a former landfill, um, it requires pilings that were not um, originally anticipated. Um, but the main thing here is the increased cost of construction and labor and the skyrocketing price of materials that they've encountered over the past year. Um, with the unforeseen cost, the overall budget is now up to 1.65 million, meaning that they need to come up with an additional $600,000. The ask to HRM is to, top, is to provide a top up of $150,000. And I'm seeking the staff report to determine if it is possible to fulfill this ask. Um, I just wanna note that, you know, HRM originally contributed to this project because the it will include, the project will include um, public washroom facilities. And um, for HRM to build and service public washrooms, would the cost be much greater. So I see this fitting quite nicely with our initiative to provide more public uh, um, washrooms across the municipality. Uh, it's that they're being built on Graves Oakley um, fields, which, you know, there's a number of fields there, ball fields, rugby fields. Um, in the winter, it's where uh, Nordic Ski has a, has a track as well. So it's a really well-used facility. And I think it will be even more well-used um, with, with some washrooms and some change rooms and with this additional amenity. Um, and I also think it's worth noting that um, it will be, uh, that Spryfield will also be gaining an accessible building, um, which will be a center for many years to come. So I ask you to please consider this request for a staff report. Thank you. Thank you. See no uh, discussion on that. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question? Ian? Beginning with District 9, Councillor Clare. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. Voting in favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. <laughs> In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. Favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhit. Deputy Mayor Outhit. Mayor Savage. In favor. 
One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative, and can someone turn my video back on, please? Uh, we'll contact ICT. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion, I also vote to keep Councillor Hensby's video off. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion, no caveats. <laughs> Eight, Councillor Smith. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Otet. I am back and thank you. I had camera issue, I had to come back in. Thank you. I looked like David. Okay, is that all, Ian? That is everyone. That motion has passed. That motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. 12.3, uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. So um, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to amend Section 2CB of Administrative Order 17 to read, notwithstanding Section 2CA, there shall be no increase November 1st, 2021 to the annual remuneration to be paid to members. Second. Thirded by Councillor Hensby, Councillor Clary. Uh, I'll just very briefly, same motion I brought last year. Well, slightly different because John had to fix it for me last year because I really didn't word it very well. Um, so that's twice now in a whole year that he's been very helpful. Um, so in terms of this, um, it's pretty simple. We're still in COVID. The reason I moved it last year in COVID was we weren't sure what was going to happen. There was no way we could take the chance of a, a possible increase. And I think just given where we are, I know as a municipality, when we just finished our budget, we're looking pretty good. But I still think it's incumbent upon us to show residents that, um, you know, we we understand the concerns that not all but a number of people are still having and show leadership in that and not put additional pressure, although admittedly it's small pressure, but uh, symbolic pressure uh, on our budget with our own uh, potential increase in compensation. And uh, I'm happy to move that we freeze it uh, for one more year. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions? Ready for the uh, question on uh, the motion? Mr. Mayor, it's, it's, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's Tim. I'm happy to support this. I'm just wondering if we've done this during the budget, could we cut the 1% down even a little lower, maybe to 95 or something? But anyway, I will, uh, I will, uh, 0.95, I'll, I will support this, but uh, too bad it didn't come up sooner. Ready for the question, colleagues? Ian? Question. Question. Beginning with District 9, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor of the motion. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor of the symbolic motion. 16, Deputy Marotit. Put in, yes. Mayor Savage. Favor. One, Councillor Dale Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. And eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Okay, that motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Um, colleagues, let's have a look at our in-camera packages here and see if there are things that we can deal with without having to go um, in camera. I'll just look to uh, Council to see if anybody, uh, Councillor Mancini. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to see if uh, we can look at 13.4. So I'll put the motion on the floor that the Halifax Regional Council one adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated April 9th, 2021, and two 
uh, direct that the private and confidential staff report dated April 9, 2021 be maintained private and confidential, so moved. Second, Councillor Cleary. Seconded by Councillor Cleary. If everybody's okay with that, we'll go to the question. Mr. Question. Mayor, which Sorry. one is this again? Which, which motion is this one? This 13. is 13.4. Four. Four. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ian. Ian, on the vote. Hello, Mr. Mayor. April here. Ian's just having some technical difficulties. I'm going to get you an acting clerk. One moment. Oh. I thought Ian was acting just like a, a real clerk, too. <laughs> uh, there's so much I want to say, but I will not. <laughs> hey look at that mr mayor if you can hear me it's krista um hey, krista, i will hi krista the, hi <laughs> i will be the acting uh clerk so i'm just gonna go in the order of council so okay. district uh one yep. voting in favor of the motion district two affirmative District three. In favor. District four. Sorry, uh, in favor. District five. In favor. District six. Voting in favor of the motion. District seven. For the motion. District eight. Four. District nine. Yes. District 10. In favor. District 11. In favor. <laughs> District 12. In favor of the motion. District 13. Yes. District 14. Voting yes on the motion. District 15. In favor. District 16 at our deputy mayor. Our Bedford uh, girl saved us. Voting <laughs> yes. And our mayor. Uh, in favor. So that motion carries. Thank you, uh, Krista, very much. Colleagues, is there anything else anybody wants to try before we go consider going in camera? Mr. Mayor, I could do uh, 13.5 if uh, and test my colleagues. Um, I'm not sure. Is everybody okay with that? Uh, is it, would, would people rather discuss that in camera? No, I'm fine with it, Mr. Mayor. I'm fine with that. Me too. Uh, sorry, which number was that? 13.5. 13.5. Okay, you can try it, uh, Councillor. All right, I'll move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated May 5th, 2021, and 2 release the private and confidential staff report dated May 5th, 2021 to the public once the conditions as outlined in the report have been met. Second. Seconded by Councillor Lovelace. I just want to make sure every councillor is aware of what we're discussing and don't want to um okay let's go to the vote beginning, hi hi beginning with district 10 councillor morse in favor 11 councillor cuddle in favor 12 councillor stoddard Sorry, in favor of the motion. 13, <laughs> Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Yes. Mayor Savage. Uh, in favor. One, Councillor Daigle Gallon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. 
Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Okay, that, that motion carries. Mr. Mayor, uh, do you want to try a 13.2? Sure, I, we've got a couple of people who've offered that. Why don't you go ahead, Councillor Hensman? Uh, move that Halifax Regional Council one adopt the recommendations outlined in the private confidential staff report dated April 28, 2021, and two release the private confidential private and confidential staff report dated April 28, 2021 to the public once the conditions as outlined in the report have been met. Second Mancini. Seconded by Councillor Mancini. We all good for the vote on that one? Question. 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 Beginning with District 11, Councillor Cuddle. Oh, um, in favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. I'm not sure about this one. I'm going to vote against it. Uh, so, against the motion. 16, Deputy Mayor Woodhead. Argue with himself and he lost. Uh, voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor? One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. And 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. That motion carries. There's one item left, which I assume we will deal with in uh, camera. Just before we go in camera, are people prepared now if I go to notices of motion? Yep. Do people need time to get ready or? Okay, I'm gonna call notices of motion right now then, uh, um, colleagues. Mayor. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Take notice that at the next or at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to propose amendments to one, Administrative Order 46 respecting asset naming policies, the purpose of which is to allow commemorative renaming, and two, Administrative Order 29 respecting HRM civic addressing policies, the purpose of which is to allow for Council's future consideration of increased flexibility in street renamings and the potential for apostrophes in street names. Okay. Um, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Take notice that the, at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move first reading of proposed bylaw M202, amending bylaw M200 respecting standards for residential occupancies, the purpose of which is to enhance the law by imposing a greater penalty when a landlord deliberately creates a non compliant or uninhabitable condition in a building. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to, just for clarity, in case anyone feels deja vu, this is a re-notice of motion because the original notice period expired, the report was not ready in time. So take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to propose adopting Administrative Order 2021-003 OP respecting municipal design guidelines, the purpose of which is to provide a mechanism for adopting amendments to the engineering specifications. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I propose to one, move first reading of proposed bylaw S315, amending bylaw S300, respecting streets, the purpose of which is to exempt roadside memorials located in the right of way uh, from parts of the bylaw, and two, adopt the administrative order 2020 006 OP, regard, uh, respecting roadside memorials the purpose of which is to set guidelines for the placement of roadside memorials within the municipally owned public right of way. So duly moved. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so we have dealt with items 13, 2, 13, 4, 13, 5, 
Um, here, 13.3 has been deferred to the next meeting, taken off the agenda. So that leaves one item in camera. If it's the will, will of camera, does somebody want to move we go in camera to discuss? So moved, Councillor Russell. Moved by Second. Councillor Russell. Seconded by Councillor Hensby. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We will adjourn. Ian, we have an in-camera appointment in our calendars, I assume. Ian, you're muted. There is an in-camera appointment in your calendars. Uh, we will not need to return to this meeting prior to six o'clock, but we will be returning at six o'clock for the citizenship ceremony. So if anybody is watching at home, it'll be having the blank screen on there until six, six o'clock. So what about ratification, Ian? We don't need to... Uh... Oh, sorry, I missed that. We can we can we can come back and ratify that. My apologies. Yeah. Okay, colleagues, I'll see you uh, on the other side.
Good afternoon, members are just making their way in from the in-camera session. Um, we are turning to the public meeting. Uh, we can take the screen down, please. And Mayor Savage, I think we're ready to go on your call. Okay, I'm good to go. You are. Okay, colleagues, we're back in the public session to uh, ratify the business that we took care of in camera. Item 13.1, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated March 15th, 2021, and 2 direct that the private and confidential staff report dated March 15th, 2021 be maintained private and confidential. Seconded, Lovelace. Seconded by Councillor Lovelace. Ready for the question, colleagues? Ian? Question. Beginning with District 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Otet. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Is that it, Ian? That is everyone. Thank you, and the motion carries. Thank you, Councillor uh, Russell. All right, colleagues, we've done notices of motion. I'll just give people a chance to see if there's any more. If not, it is our intent to recess until 6 p.m. I just want to remind everybody, 6 p.m. And what, um, what uh, screen are we in, uh, Mr. Clark, on this one? It is this Zoom meeting, yes. It is the same link. So we're back here tonight, at, uh, try to be on time at six o'clock. Um, myself and the deputy mayor will say a few words and then each councillor will um, uh, announce the award recipients. Everybody has the information that they need, I hope. Um, and it should be a, a good evening to opportunity to recognize some pretty special folks in our community. Okay, we will recess until Six o'clock tonight, same bad channel, right back here. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. It is now six o'clock. We are returning your cameras and your microphones to you, and we'll be taking the screen off right now. We do have quorum. Uh, Mayor Savage, we are ready to go on your call. Okay, Ian, it is six o'clock. So I guess we can go uh, anytime, Ian. We are ready on your go. Okay, all right. Okay, today is May the 18th, 2021. And we are here in sitting in well, we're not really sitting in council, but we're at council uh, for the Citizenship Awards. Now, this is uh, one of the very special events of the year for all of us. In fact, I would say the Citizenship Awards and the Volunteer Awards that we do uh, are really important. And I'm proud that we're a municipality that recognizes both of these, uh, both of these things. So tonight, of course, we're doing it differently. And it's really kind of, it's nice that we're here doing it, but it's really sad that we're not doing it in person, that I don't get a chance to stand and uh, shake the hands of uh, our young people as well as their families and teachers. Um, it's just not quite the same. And uh, you as counselors uh, don't get a chance to do the same thing either. So that's kind of a, a disappointing thing. So, but we're excited about the quality of the uh, young people that we're going to honor tonight. And, um, uh, you know, we are in fact honoring great citizenship and that's a really cool thing. So first of all, Emily Smith, are you with us? Yes, I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Nice to see you. I can't see you. Show us your face. Are you on camera? I want people to know how much work you've done on this. Uh, it's amazing. You've been working on this. You've done it before. This year, we went through a number of different iterations and potential uh, citizenship awards, didn't we? Yes. Yes, we did. And you've managed it all with uh, great uh, style and grace, and I must say great patience. It's not easy to deal with the deputy mayor all the time on stuff like this. Or any of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Emily, thank you on behalf of all of us for organizing this. It's uh, awesome work. Um, and so tonight, now just so I understand, the students are not actually on the screen with us, right? They're going to be watching at home? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So, uh, thank you. We will begin. And just the order of proceedings will be that I'll say a few words that Deputy Mayor will say a few words, and then I will call upon each councillor to recognize the um, students in their districts uh, who are getting getting the awards. So um, anyway, Emily, I wanted to say thank you to you. Thank um, you very much, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you. This has been such a challenging time for the world, for all of us. And to the students tonight who are being uh, honored, You've been living your lives, you've been doing your studies during a pandemic. And that's not something that most of the rest of us on the screen had to do as a student, with the possible exception of Councillor Purdy, who I think is still actually doing some studying, right, Councillor Purdy? Yes, I sure am, Mr. Mayor. So that is a challenging thing. Um, you know, I'm, I, I was always, uh, I've been a big fan of a number of people who've influenced me. One of those who well-known people that, who I had been influenced by was Robert Kennedy. Um, and he gave a speech, and I'm saying this to our students now. He gave a speech in 1966. He went to South Africa. Nelson Mandela was in prison at Robben Island. Apartheid was raging. And Robert Kennedy went to South Africa to speak about the change that young people can make. He spoke at the University of Cape Town in 1966, exactly two years before he died. So this was June of 1966. And he gave the speech that, he, that became known as the Ripples of Hope speech. And in that speech, he said, and I'm quoting, few will have the greatness to bend history itself but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all these acts will be written the history of our generation. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a person stands up for an ideal 
or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, she or he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. And then two years later to the day he was assassinated, but his vision lived on in people like Nelson Mandela and many people today. See, those ripples can be big things. They can be grand, they can be noble, they can be very public. They can be super notable. They can be done in ways that millions of people notice. But they can also be done in many simpler ways. By spending time with somebody who has nobody else to spend time with. By delivering food to somebody locked at home during a pandemic. By working in a food bank or being a literacy buddy or just reaching out to see if somebody wants a hand. You are the ripples of hope for us. When we see the work that you do in your communities, keeping up your studies, spending time, helping out, those are the ripples of hope that we feel, those of us that are, in some cases, a different generation than you. And I gotta tell you, it makes me feel very proud to see these names and to recognize the great work that is being done by the young people of our community. And I'm very proud to be here with you tonight. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and what wonderful words. And you mentioned Robert Kennedy, and I'll say one of my favorite ones was uh, his brother, former uh, President uh, John F. Kennedy, Jack Kennedy. And he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Well, I'll take that a little further today and we'll say community. And boy, do we have some young people here that we're recognizing this evening uh, that have done a lot for their community, even though they're at the ripe old age of grade nine. So what a wonderful thing. So good evening to all. It gives me great pleasure to virtually welcome you to our annual Citizenship Awards. A good citizen is someone who strives to make their community a better place by being an active part of their neighborhoods, looking out for fellow residents, and being a good example to those around them. I am so inspired by the young men and women we, all, we honor here tonight. They are grade nine students, and some of them have more on their resumes than we, any of us on council have, and they're only in grade nine, and man, they are impressive. They're gonna be good politicians down the road, or maybe even something even better, even better, big uh, community leaders. You have inspired us with your uh, commitment to academics and your community. Each of you was selected for this honor because you go above and beyond, and you motivate others to do the same. The hard work and the commitment that you have demonstrated is a source of celebration for your family, your friends, your school, and our community. I hope that you will remember the pride you feel today and that it will spur you on to continue to do things. We wish you every success as you continue to serve others and strive to attend your personal goals. Please join me in congratulating the 38 young men and women who are the recipients of the 2021 Citizenship Awards. You'd be, you should be very proud of your accomplishments, and we are very proud of you. Thank you, Mayor. Indeed. I also want to thank um, the families, um, and I want to thank the teachers. Yes. We've all been inspired by teachers. I could probably ask everybody on this screen, every counselor could tell me a teacher or two that made a difference to them. For me, it was Mrs. Thomas, it was Mr. Peralta, it was uh, Mr. Watson, and uh, Jean Beliveau. Uh, those are my uh, favorite teachers. Uh, the teachers do a great job, and we really appreciate the work that teachers do in building citizenship. And I, I know that everybody here loves going into the schools when we're not in COVID and having a chance to talk with uh, the young people of today. So I want to thank all of those folks. and. Uh, um, we're now going to list, I think Emily will tell me if I'm wrong, but we're going to go district by district and I'm going to introduce the councillors and the councillors have the list of names, I think, of who the people in their district are that we are honouring today. We're going to begin in Great District 1, Councillor Kathy Daigle-Gammon. Councillor Daigle-Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. It's such a pleasure for me to um, be the first to uh, read off the two nominees from, or the two award recipients rather from District 1. And I'm really hopeful that uh, post COVID we get to meet 
And so from Muscadaba Rural High School, we have T. Abdel Massey. From Lockview High School, we have Xavier Nathaniel Paris. All right. So bo to both of you, yes. So I encourage both uh, Tia and uh, Xavier to uh, uh, go to Councillor Daigle Gammon's house as soon as COVID is over and she'll give you pizza and a barbecue and uh, something to drink uh, that's, that's safe and wholesome. But that's District 1. Thank you, Councillor. Great. All right. Now we go to the guy who always has a bunch of great uh, nominees, Councillor uh, David Hensby from District 2. Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the artwork behind me. This is Bob Pettipaw of Woodlawn Dartmouth. He's a photographic print artist. I want to show today's colors of Nova Scotia. This is Nova Scotia strong and how we are all pieces of the same fabric woven together. And these young people today, these young citizens are the future of Nova Scotia. And I want to acknowledge that we are Nova Scotia strong because of these strong young citizens. I'd like to acknowledge the following five, uh, one, two, three, five constituents. No, I have six, I believe. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six constituents uh, from my uh, district. First, from the very first class of Marine Drive Academy, the new school in Sheet Harbor, we have Grace Jane Rutherford. Congratulations, Jane. And from the Ombre Academy, I have Liz Bur Burbonier. And then from the Ecole et Secondaire Mosaic, I have Sebastian Dijon. And from Grain Creighton Junior High, my old high school alma mater, uh, Jamela Burrell. And from Ross Road School, I have Sophie LaMarchant. And from Gatesbrook Junior High, Faith McKinnon. Congratulations to you all. Thank you for your endeavors in school and hope to hear more great things from you as you progress into high school and beyond. Congratulations. Folks, I'm gonna encourage you, if you're gonna clap, to take your, come, come off mute when you clap so the kids can actually hear, hear the applause when the time comes, all right? So thank you very much, uh, Councillor uh, Hensby. Uh, District three. Councillor Becky Kent, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It is my distinct pleasure to acknowledge and congratulate two young people in our district of District 3 at our many uh, junior highs. And, you know, we have so many wonderful people, as you can see by my background, the young people that are doing great things. We often don't get to hear about them. So it's especially nice this evening to be able to acknowledge Ethan Page, from Eric Graves Memorial Junior High School and Marguerite Sherlock from Island View High School. It's uh, my pleasure to congratulate you and I do look forward to meeting you in person. That's my commitment to you. I don't make a lot of promises in this job but I promise to find some time to meet you, perhaps take you out to lunch and be able to hear more about what you are up to. I know as Councillor Hensby had noted that you know, we look forward to hearing and seeing more things that are, are going to come forward from you. And um, I just look forward to, to that opportunity in a personal way. So congratulations and well done to all of the families that help raise and, and develop our young people. It, you, you have a lot to be proud of this evening as well. All right. Let me just say to... Uh... Marguerite from Island View High School. If you happen to get back to school anytime soon and you see that principal, Mr. Savage, tell him he's not as funny as he thinks he is, would you? Uh, District four, we have uh, one, two, three names and Councillor Trish Purdy, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a great honor and a privilege. And I think it's so cool that I get the grade nine student from Halifax Christian Academy because that's where five of my kids went to school. So I, that is so awesome. Um, so I want to congratulate these awesome grade nine students. Gabrielle Clark from Sir Robert Borden Junior High School. Gavin Johnston from Halifax Christian Academy and Emma Toop from Astral Drive Junior High School. And I just wanted to say that you all have been chosen because your teachers see and have seen something really special in you. 
And so I want you to always remember that there is something very special about who you are and never forget that. And no matter what trials come your way and you all have gotten through COVID and you're continuing to get through COVID with all of these challenges that are so unique to your generation. I mean, this has never happened before. So I just want to say congratulations again. Well done. Never give up. Stay the course and you will never regret it. So congratulations, students. Thank you, Council. Uh, District 5, uh, uh, two, two students, and I just want them to know that uh, this is Councillor Austin. This is not a fellow high school student that you're going to see. <laughs> Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two of my own children out there, in fact. So, <laughs> um, so I have two names here. So uh, big congratulations to Claire Ferguson of Shambhala School and Robbie Swift of Caledonia Junior High School. So congratulations to both Claire and Robbie for the amazing work that they've done and for being such solid role models in the community. Well done. All right. Beautiful. Uh, district six, probably the most beautiful district in HRM. And we have uh, Councillor Tony Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, uh, thank you to uh, all the students receiving awards tonight for all that you do in our community. First of all, I'd like for, to uh, acknowledge from Dartmouth High School, Heidi Grace Lockyer LeClaire, go Spartans, well done, Heidi. And from Ellenvale Junior High School, Matea Weeks Williams, go Eagles, well done, Matea. Uh, so believe in yourself, students, and during this pandemic especially, be kind to others. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well done, everyone. Thank you, Councillor. From District 7, we have a Councillor Way Mason. Councillor Mason. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hello, everyone. So uh, such a strange time to be recognizing people. And uh, as, as other councillors have said, I look forward to actually meeting uh, you when we actually have a chance to meet again. And so I'd like to congratulate from Sacred Heart School of Halifax, Laura Falloon for her uh, you know, citizenship and service and uh, looking forward to a time when we can all meet. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Councillor Lindell Smith from District 8. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. Well, I'd like to give a big congratulations and shout out to Bridget Kerrigan, Highland Park Junior High. Thank you for all your work you do for the community and for your school and, and your fellow colleagues. So congratulations and, and thank you. <laughs> all right, we have uh, three from uh, District 9, Councillor Sean Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Between the horn and the way you just introduced me, I feel like I'm about to come out on the ice at a hockey game. <clears throat> um, and I really appreciate, uh, Mr. Mayor and Deputy Mayor, that you quoted uh, Robert Kennedy and, and John F. Kennedy and not Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, no one ever does. So that's a good thing. Um, people can look them up if they need to know what's going on. Uh, this is important. Uh, well, so let me also say my 15 year old who's in grade nine wasn't on this list. In fact, his school's not even on the list. So uh, we were going to have words after this, uh, but uh, since no one from his school made it, I don't have to punish him now. Uh, but what's really cool is the three folks on the list here uh, go to schools not in District 9, although one does. Uh, the other two live in District 9, but go to schools outside District 9. So Katia Macbeth from Sandy Lake Academy, Catherine Boyle from Halifax Central Junior High, and Rebecca Camo, uh, who goes to Kennard Junior High, uh, have won uh, the Citizenship Award. And of course, it's important to remember that this award uh, acknowledges those who exemplify the qualities of leadership, of service, and of academics. It's the trifecta of what we want in our young people. So I'm very proud that these three uh, young folks uh, uh, 
all women, I believe, uh, live in District 9 and have excelled in this way. So congratulations to them and all the other uh, recipients. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Morris, your first opportunity to, uh, to do this. Next year will be more fun. You'll get to do it in person. But uh, Councillor Catherine Morris from District 10. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, whether it's in person or online, it's still a great honor to congratulate Jane, sorry, Jane Elliott of Clayton Park Junior High, my old junior high school, and Wangari Methenge of Goresbrook Junior High School. Congratulations to you both and to your families for balancing your schoolwork with the commitment to the community. And thank you for being our ripples of hope. Thank you, Councillor. From District 11, uh, we have uh, four for Councillor Patty Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and congratulations to all the students from District 11. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes was by Margaret Mead that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And uh, I have no doubt that you are all going to set out and change the world. So congratulations from Brookside Junior High School to Anna Lynn Sampson. From Rockingstone Heights School, Shamil Beijing. From Herring Cove Junior High School, Ruby Agnes. And from Elizabeth Sutherland School, Maya Ohechuk. Awesome. Thank you. Wow, Councillor Stoddard, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, five for Councillor Iona Stoddard from District 12. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, colleagues, and congratulations to all of our recipients and their parents um, for homeschooling during these difficult times. Uh, congratulations to Yahia Fahala at Maritime Muslim Academy. Ni Cheng at Halifax Grammar School. Aiden Eason at the Foundation Academy of the Sacred Heart School of Halifax. Ishman Jahale, Jahala, sorry, Park West, Park West School. Aniva A. O'Connell at Ridgecliff Middle School. Thank you. Uh, congratulations and be the best you can be. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, from beautiful District 13, Councillor Pam Lovelace. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. Thank you so much. And congratulations to all of the award recipients tonight. I am very pleased uh, to honor uh, two individuals from District 13 who have gone above and beyond in their schoolwork, uh, commitment to community, Start, you know, going through online learning and just hanging in there. So I just want to say to Ellie and Brenna, you are both setting a very strong example. Keep up the good work. Ellie Allen from Madeline Simons Middle School. Congratulations. Go Jaguars. And Brenna Hovey from uh, Five Bridges Junior High School. Keep up the good work. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, District 14, everybody's favorite counselor, Councillor Lisa Blackburn, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, big congratulations to uh, the award recipient from District 14. And I know this isn't the school year that you had expected, but uh, not only have you persevered, but uh, you excelled and this is uh, this award is really quite special in our house because uh, my daughter was the recipient uh, of this award when she was in grade nine so uh, I know how hard you have worked for this so congratulations to Abigail Kohler from Millwood High School. Awesome thank you Councillor. Uh, from Sackville uh, District 15, Councillor Paul Russell. Thank you. I would like to congratulate Gail Churchill from Sackville High um, on, on, the, uh, on this award. It is phenomenal. 
Uh, one of the things that Sackville has been known for within the community and around is the sense of community that we have out here. And to be able to help out with that and contribute to that and make Sackville an even better place to live, uh, I just, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, uh, that you're able to contribute and, and thank you very much for that. Um, when I was on the school board 20 years ago, my favorite day of the year was graduation day because we saw so many young people cross the stage and accomplish their first really big thing in life. And today is on par with that because you are doing exactly the same thing. Uh, congratulations, Gail. I wish you the very best. Thank you, Councillor. Deputy Mayor, Count Deputy Mayor Outfit, uh, take us home. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it takes a while to get through to the best district, but here we are from Bedford uh, Wentworth District 16. I want to congratulate and thank Yasmin Merpoya from Rocky Lake Junior High. And Yasmin, I wish you great success and happiness in your future endeavors. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That is our list of recipients. Um, just a final word perhaps to, to the recipients. Uh, appreciate the families that you come from, appreciate your teachers. Um, and I would encourage you to appreciate the community in which we're all fortunate to live. This land of the Mi'kmaq people, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq with the strong and vibrant uh, communities, the African Nova Scotian communities, many people from around the world. I can tell from some of the names that were announced tonight that Probably some of you come from families that, you know, are, are fairly new to our community. And all of, these, all of these different communities is what makes the Halifax Regional Municipality such a wonderful place. Appreciate the diversity of those around you um, and work to make it better. And I know that that's what each of you are doing. And uh, I think you, you sense in, in the faces of the councillors on this screen, um, the great pride that we feel when we see people like yourselves who are stepping up and trying to make things uh, better for all of us. I hope, uh, Emily, uh, that um, we might yet be able to do um, a reception of some kind once COVID is over. Perhaps we could try to do something here at City Hall uh, uh, or Emily, maybe at your house uh, where we could bring all these people together like we would have normally would have done. Um, so hopefully that's a conversation that we can have and on some warm summer night, uh, post COVID that we'll have a chance to see you in person. I can tell you that I meet people who we gave awards to like Councillor Blackburn's daughter, uh, the Florence Nightingale of uh, Beaver Bank. Uh, I can tell you that when I meet people who have now graduated, who got this award, um, they've turned out to be pretty good people and that's not a surprise. So again, thank you to all of you. Emily, is there anything else that we need to uh, to do tonight? No, nope, that's everything, Mr. Mayor. Well, uh, let's all have a round of applause. Uh, and all of you folks at home, let's give Emily a round of applause to put this together during yeah. COVID. And of course, uh, thanks to Mel as well, uh, Melody Campbell. There's our CAO folks. Uh, if you're listening at home, there's Jacques Dubé with the cool looking glasses. He's our CAO. Uh, someday you may aspire to be mayor, or if you have higher ambitions, CAO, uh, or uh, <laughs> anything beyond that, which I recommend. Counselor, yeah, yeah, higher up in counselor. <laughs> uh, again, one last round of applause for the award winners tonight, the recipients. It is a great pleasure. It is an honor. And we thank you very much for your commitment to being good citizens, not only of Halifax, but of the world. Thank you all very much. Uh, Bulaliuk, the very best wishes. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Folks, see you now. Thanks, Mayor Savage, can motion to adjourn? So I'm going to motion to adjourn from Councillor Purdy. Absolutely. Be inspired by these kids. Be inspired by them, young people. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.